A few weeks ago, before the global lockdown, I was lucky enough to sit down and have a conversation with a truly remarkable man, Michael Groom. In passing, you'd be excused in thinking Mike was a typical everyday guy, because in a lot of ways he is. He's a softly spoken plumber from Australia who loves the outdoors and his family. But there's another side to Mike. Over the past 40 years, Mike has dedicated his life to mountaineering. In this time, he has ventured to some of the most remote areas on the planet and been involved in countless extraordinary adventures. He was one of the first, if not the first, Australian to climb the six highest peaks in the world without using supplemental oxygen. But he climbed five of these six peaks after losing the front third of each foot to frostbite. This meant he had to teach himself how to walk, climb, and do just about everything in life again. In 1996, there was an infamous disaster on Mount Everest, where unfortunately a lot of people lost their lives. This event has been scribed in the pages of history in novels such as Into Thin Air by John Krakauer and movies like Everest starring Jake Gyllenhaal. Well, Mike was on this expedition as well and he was the only surviving guide to make it off the mountain alive. He's been awarded an Order of Australia by the Prime Minister for his contribution to mountaineering around the world. These are all just a few of the things that have happened in Mike's truly remarkable life. Aaron, my producer, and I really couldn't get enough of Mike's stories. We really could have asked him questions for days. He's an absolute gentleman and an inspirational human being. I hope everyone enjoys and gets as much out of Mike's stories as I did. This is the exploration of everything. Right, welcome. Michael Groom, thank you so much for coming in, mate. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Mate, I read your book in the last, over the Christmas holidays. I read your book and it was one of the best reads I have read in a very long thank time. Thank uh, to, to sum you up and describe uh, your achievements in this book mm. uh, that I read, You were the first Australian to climb the four highest peaks in the world without oxygen. Please Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on any uh, stuff. Fourth person in the world. Fourth person in the world, the first Australian. Uh, Yeah. 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 (laughs) (laughs) Um, Not that I've been keeping records. Not that you've been keeping records. I was told that. I I don't keep records of first, fastest, oldest, most disabled, uh, whatever title they want to put on me. But uh, a, a Himalayan historian told me, that I was the fourth person in the world. Wow. And that's without supplemental oxygen? Mm, yep. And that is an extremely difficult task because above, wh- where's the death zone? Above 8,000 metres? Oh, that's a media title. They call oh, it the right. death zone. Above 8,000 metres, 26,000 feet. Right. And that's where things get a bit hairy? That's where things, when the the wheels can fall off pretty, qu- pretty quickly and easily. So you've not only done that, but you, after summiting the first 8,000 metre peak, you lost the front third of both your feet mm. due to frostbite and you went on to summit all the rest and I think you've summited the first, the, the highest six mountains in the world. Yes, uh, although I do k- tend to keep the sixth one a bit of a secret. Um, the reason being... I'm sorry if I just spoiled that. No, <laughs> no, no, that. it's just that some p- people, when they ask me, oh, how many mountains have you climbed? I'll start, you know, start off with one to six and they think, they said, oh, they'll say... Well, when are you going to climb the other four? As if I haven't quite finished the job. <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's the human brain is sort of programmed to yeah. think in certain numbers that are important, like yeah. one, three, five, and ten, or something like that. I, I, don't, I don't know. But if, yeah. So I just say five, and if I say five, the five highest, they're happy with that. They're right. But if you get out of sequence, like you've climbed the six highest. Six, why haven't you done ten? Why haven't you done the other four? <laughs> right, wow. <laughs> so that's why I keep it a secret. Okay, <laughs> all right. Well, why haven't you done the other four? I'm joking, mate. I'm joking. Um, so, mate, especially for someone coming from this part of the world where we live in southeast Queensland, Australia, in Australia in a general where there are zero mountains. Yes, and it's also the world's flattest continent. World's flattest continent. Mm. How did you go from being a... Uh, a young guy growing up here mm. in Australia to being a phenomenal mountaineer. Mm. Well, to make it even more unlikely, I was born in Cloncurry. <laughs> right. 
Near Man Isa. Uh, which actually, uh, Cloncurry holds an Australian record. What's that? The highest recorded temperature. Oh, really? In Australia. 53.1 degrees Celsius. Wow. And that's the reason why we left. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why you go to the coldest places. Yeah. Uh, well, that's the reason. I, I mean, I, 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 know, I remember nothing about Cloncurry. Mm. Uh, I think my parents left when I was about two years old. And uh, we came to live in the southeast corner of Queensland. In fact, a place called Binnaburra Lodge, which is uh, unfortunately uh, nothing more than ashes. I know, it was mate. destroyed in the uh, the uh, the bushfires of the summer of uh, 2019, 2020. Uh, as it had a 90-year history w- associated with it. And your grandfather My built grandfather that. built it uh, and was co-founder along with Romeo Lay 90 years ago. Uh, and that's that's where I grew up. And uh, it's probably because of Binnaburra and living in that environment where the National Park was my playground and adventure was, you know, we had to invent our own games, if you like, and, it was, and bushwalking and camping and rock climbing and abseiling and all that sort of stuff was just normal to me. I mean, I was doing that before I started school. So it's a great probably place for a kid to grow yeah, up. Yeah, like absolutely. And I, but the trouble is I didn't realise it. At the time, you just sort of take it for granted. When you're p- a five-year-old, you think, well, yep. this is normal. And it was only until I left the place uh, that I realised what a great place it was. And so, unfortunately, that did burn down mm. the last couple mm. of months in the bushfire. How connected are you still to the place? Uh, or is it just a, you know, the well, history I'll, of the place? Well, I'll, my heart's still up there, but I, 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 ch- I, I live in Brisbane for a whole lot of other reasons. Yeah, mm. yeah. So you grew up there. Mm. Uh, you got to play around in the national park. Yeah. So as the family came. My my parents came back to help run the lodge, uh, and in doing so, my father renewed his interest in rock climbing, and made some first ascents of the the rock faces that we have around Brisbane, including the Glasshouse Mountains, and Mount Barney. So again, I was exposed to that right from a very early age, and I just thought it was natural. Uh, but it didn't come natural to me. <laughs> my little brother was far, a far better climber than me. Uh, but I think, you know, when you have to work hard at something, uh, I think uh, to, to achieve a certain level, then I think you appreciate it more. Whereas my brother was a natural, he was good at it, a lot of things that he turned his hand to. But in doing that, he also became bored quickly and then moved right. on to something else. Whereas right. I had to try hard to keep up to my brother as a climber uh, and but in doing so, I appreciated the uh, the rewards more probably. There was a story in the first chapter of your book where you were your father was taking you your little your little brother yes and yes. a group of uh, people guests, abseiling guests from the lodge yes yes called, uh, over uh, a waterfall called Balanjui Falls. It was a three stage abseil, and the first stage is quite a long abseil, maybe 120 140 meters. We had to have special ropes. And then 90 metres and then 80 metres after that. But the 120 metre abseil right off the top, it was quite a lot of exposure. And I kept putting my turn off until the very, very last person. So it, just, it was just me and Dad. And my brother went over before me he, and he made it look effortless. Uh, and then my turn, I was so scared and petrified that I, I literally grovelled and slid Instead of walking backwards over the edge, I sort of lay my belly and <laughs> wriggled over the edge. And that was, uh, yes, uh, I remember that one well. Wow. And so then uh, your father told you while you were looking up at Mount Barney, which isn't a huge mountain, it's about 1,000 metres tall. 1,300, I think. 1,300 metres tall. You were looking up at that mountain and your dad explained to you about uh, Mount Everest and how mm. much bigger and... and how this is the tallest mountain in the world. And that really captured your imagination, didn't it? It certainly did. And I actually have a photograph of that event. Right. Yeah. So uh, so to, to sort of s- to, to give an idea, I was... Just, Mike, just move that one just a little bit. You can twist that mic just so it's pointed straight at your mouth. Yeah, like, yeah, that. like perfect, that. Perfect, yep. mate. Perfect. Have you got a sound... Have you got a, a monitor, have you? Uh, this German here. Right it's here all, it's all good. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, perfect. All right, so the photo. <coughs> You're looking up at Mount Barney. Yeah, so I was about, uh, we're on one of our camping trips. So uh, mum and dad and my brother and myself were off camping at the base of Mount Barney. And this must have been back in the very, very early 60s. Um, And dad 
wanted to get a photo of me standing in front of Mount Barney. So he said, I'll go and walk, stand over there next to that barbed wire fence. And I, I did that. Mm. And I'm back to the camera and he said, it takes a photograph. And then I'm walking back to him and he says, oh, do you realise there's a mountain in this world that's eight times higher than Mount Barney? And I looked around at Mount Barney and I put my f- thumb and um, what's this finger called? Uh, index, index finger. finger. Index finger to get the, the size of Mount Barney between those two, th- the thumb and index finger. And then I placed eight times, and, I th- and th- I'm sort of bending over backwards wow. with the, the, what I thought was the height, the incredible height of Mount Everest. Yep. Um, and, so that, and it just captured my, captured my imagination uh, from that, that day onwards. But uh, having said that, even from a very early age, when I, even when I was looking at Mount Barney, he was almost saying to me, Come a little closer. Right. And I've always had that, m- mountains have always had that magnetic pull for me. It's like they're saying, you know, you're looking at me, why don't you come a bit closer? Yeah, yeah I've right. got some secrets to show you. Oh, okay. No, I mean the, the mountain. Yeah, the yeah, mountain yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. are you a spiritual guy or no. a religious guy? No. Or you, no. When you talk about stuff like that, I know uh, on all the adventures you've had some pretty... Yeah. Uh, yeah, close calls and a lot of different experience, but nothing from a young age where you go, you know, this is, this is a part of me calling me out into the wild or anything like, like that. Nothing like that. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> 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 All right. We sorry, to, to, sorry to disappoint. Uh, you. No, that's cool. Um, so then you thought, didn't you think for a while too, your that your dad uh, had gone off and climbed Everest? Oh yes, that's a good one. Yeah. So. Shortly after this Mount Barney experience, you were at school and you yeah. So w- I, was, I was at grade one uh, at Beachmont State School, uh, a total, total uh, student population of about twenty-two for over seven grades. So it was very very small school. Uh, and so in this on this particular day, there was grade one, two, three, and four all in the cl- all in the same room. And the teacher was going around the class asking each boy and girl to come to the front of the class and tell the rest of the class what they would like to do when they grew up. Yep. Now, I, be, I, I grew up in a, in, at a place called Beachmont, which is a, was then a big dairy farming community. So every person was standing up and saying, well, I'm going to be a dairy farmer just like mum and dad. And I'm thinking quietly to myself, well, this is a bit boring. I'm <laughs> <laughs> I need to... Uh, I need to say something different. And I actually didn't know what my, my mum and dad did. They worked at the lodge, right. but how do you tell people what, yep. they, what they do? And I didn't know. Uh, and uh, the, the thing that I did know at this particular week at school was my father wasn't working. He was away climbing. Uh, right. And I thought, okay, I've got it. He's, not, he's already climbed Mount Barney. Yep. There's only one Tick. other mountain he could be climbing. <laughs> 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 so I, 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 I proudly... Proudly stood up in front of the class and said, "Look, my my dad is a mountain climber, and he's climbing Mount Everest this week." <laughs> and what was the response that the teacher gave? <laughs> Just you like you said. <laughs> 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 uh, my teacher tried to hide the laugh. Yeah. Um, behind cupped hands. And then she said, "Oh, Michael." Once she gained composure, she said, "Oh, Michael, your your dad wouldn't be climbing Mount Everest." And I don't know where it went from then. But I was very embarrassed, and as I made my way back to um, my desk, I thought to myself, well, my dad has climbed Mount Everest, and I am too. I'm <laughs> going to w- climb Mount Everest one day too. And that was the first time it popped into your head that you're going to climb this mountain? Um, yeah, it could well have been, yeah, yeah. I mean, I kept it a secret for for, for many, many, actually decades, because I, I just thought it was such a, a grand statement to make, and a very bold statement to make. That Extremely I bold yeah, here so I, I in didn't, Australia. I didn't tell anyone, and the only one I told was a friend of mine who I shared a house with for many years, uh, Peter Gash, uh, and uh, good friend of mine who's been on the yeah, podcast. So he's the only person I told uh, because I trust I trusted Peter that he wouldn't ridicule me or anything like that. So yeah, he he told that story when he was on here that uh, he told you that he was going to be. A pilot? Yeah. If that's what he was going off to do, and you told him that you were going to climb, climb mountains, Mount Everest, and yeah. you're going to go up Mount Everest. Mm, and we did. And you both said, yep, cool, well, let's go and do it. <laughs> and you both went out and did it, which yep. is phenomenal. Mm. So you had that early experience, and then you kind of hit it for a long time. And then 
Uh, in your mid-teens, you went over to your father at the time was then over in Alaska. Uh, I finished my plumbing apprenticeship here in Brisbane. So that so I left school. I left high school as soon as I could because I hated high school. I wanted to learn, but school wasn't for me. And so I came. I came to Brisbane uh, at the age of fifteen or sixteen, and started an apprenticeship as a plumber. And I finished that when I was about twenty, I think it was, or twenty-one. I can't remember now. And unfortunately, my parents had separated uh, the year I started high school. So I hadn't seen my father for about nine years, and he was now living in Alaska. Right. So I decided, okay, I'll finish my apprenticeship. I'll go and see, visit my dad in Alaska. And uh, I I, I lived in in Alaska for about a year and a half. Your father must have been an adventurous man, though, to to go, I'm going to move to Alaska, especially... 30 years ago or whenever it was, 40 yeah. years ago, that's the other side of the world. That is a remote place. Yes, and that's why I went there. Yeah, so that's a that's a game thing for a man to do, mm. to move from southeast Queensland to, mm. to Alaska. So mm. he must have been a very adventurous man. Well, it's that runs in the family. I mean, Arthur Groom uh, used to explore central Australia with some camels and Aboriginal um, guides. So right. And that was before Binnabar started back in the 19... 19- Twenty or whenever it was, so it runs. And then my father, because of uh, knee injuries caused from climbing, he couldn't climb, so he started ocean sailing, and eventually right. sailed from Alaska all the way back to New Zealand, which took two years. Wow! So you're in Alaska. Mm. Your father took you on a, a little bit of a climb, and you, you at that point decided, hey, you want to get a little bit more serious about that, and you talked. Yeah, to him I with think your I had my twenty first birthday in Alaska, and my dad bought me an ice axe, a pair of mountaineering boots, and a set of what we call crampons, which is a, this, the metal spikes that strap on the bottom of the boots so you can walk up steep uh, snow and ice. And he said, "Here, you are. here's your twenty first birthday. Go climbing." And wow. I did. <laughs> wow. So I said, well, you know, he taught me all that he could. Yep. And he said, look, I, I've taught you all that I... Because in Alaska, there was mountains all around the place. So we were often went climbing. Um, and part of climbing in Alaska was you'd take a 12-gauge shotgun in case you came across a grizzly bear because there's grizzly bears everywhere. And th- they are terrifying. You can't, you can't outrun them. If you, can't, you can't climb a tree because they'll just knock it over. You can't outswim them, um, so you take a, a twelve gauge shotgun with what they call a bear slug in the barrel, ready to go, which is just a s- full s- slug of lead, and you've got that strapped over your shoulder. Um, Imagine you got to get you got your aim's got to be pretty good as well if you. Yeah, I mean you can put about twelve rounds into a bear, a grizzly, and it's still charging at you. Wow, I've been uh, fly fishing. In the back country of Alaska, a couple of times. Mm, so you know what it's like, mate. Uh, there was one experience. We were in this river, and we'd taken. We we're in King Salmon, which is a remote place, and then you take the float plane even deeper. And I forget the name of the national park, but we were deep in the back country. Landed on a uh, glacial lake, started hiking up this stream to to catch fish all day. Um, and I reckon we probably saw about forty bears that day, and they were all within 10 meters of us yeah. that we were and the guide was there and he had a he had a couple of guns on him and he was fully equipped for that situation it was at the peak of the salmon run mm. so there were so many salmon everywhere that the bears weren't even just eating the salmon they were just eating the eggs from yeah, the salmon just licking the, the just just licking <laughs> out the eggs <laughs> and leaving the, the rotting that you we weren't walking on the riverbank we were walking on fish carcasses yeah uh, it, it was phenomenal, yeah. but I was on edge nonstop because these animals are huge and they're, they're scary. And it's yeah. I think that's um, it's something that we don't have really in Australia. Like if you go walking in the bush, you know the drop bear's not going to drop out of the tree and kill you. You know, like this. No, but the Americans are actually uh, more scared of our snakes. Uh, and sharks and spiders than they are their own grizzly bears. Yeah, they are. But like a snake's not going to chase you very yeah, far. Yeah, that's right. Well, if you've been bitten by a snake, which I have, I mean, it's it's pretty painless. You've been bitten by a snake. Yeah. What did you get bitten by? Well, they they don't know. <coughs> it it was thought to be a king brown. It was up at Gimpy. Oh wow! Uh, when I was about uh, nine years old. Wow. And uh, yeah, they don't, didn't actually believe me at first, but uh, yeah. Nine years old. Yep. Far out. Yeah. And uh, were you exploring at the time, or were you just... No, well, my, gran- my, 
grandparents on my maternal side had a dairy farm and so we used to go up there for our holidays and we're down near the creek and I was on one side of a small stream and the my pop's cattle dog was on the other <coughs> side of the stream. The stream is about a metre and a half wide and the dog was annoying something underneath this tree which was a snake and I was standing exactly opposite on the other bank from this tree and the snake jumped across the this is what people don't believe across the creek across the creek and bit me on the foot wow. and then jumped and fell into the into the water and swam away but i saw the snake in midair <laughs> was it and I, I had the two two fang marks in my foot so was it a dry bite or did it did you were you really sick did you have to go to hospital for oh, a I went to oh, in those days so 9 years old i was you know crying and and frightened and all that and uh, thankfully, my nan was with me, and she carried me up to the farmhouse where my pop was. And he got out the old razor blade and put oh. t- put two cuts in the in the <laughs> in the snake bite and started sucking the blood out. And oh. which is what well, you don't you just don't do that. Just, days. It's the worst move you can do. And then threw me in the back of the old uh, Morris Minor Ute, and yep, we, we putted, up, putted off to Gimpy Hospital down the dirt road. <laughs> wow, that's that's what I remember about it. Oh, I had a tourniquet on my leg too. Wow, I. My uh, best friend got bitten by a snake up at uh, Leamington National Park, a Stephen's Bandit snake about, when did we work up there? Maybe 15, uh, 15 maybe 20 years ago now mm-hmm. that we worked up there and he was uh, giving, a, giving a tour and got bitten by a Stephen's Bandit snake and I think he's the only recorded person in the country that's been bitten by one of those snakes. Oh, okay. Um, but he was, he was really crook. He, was, uh, he got flown out mm-hmm. with the Westpac rescue helicopter Got the horse serum in him. He was allergic to that, which mm. uh, he was in and out of consciousness for a, a long time, and then recovered. And so, but anyway, that's the only other snake bite story that I oh, have. Okay. But we digress from the story. Yes, what were we talking about? You were in Alaska. You oh, were hiking okay. with Gris- your dad. Grizzly bears. Yeah, t- we're talking about Americans <laughs> being more scared of our snakes and spiders than their yeah. own grizzly bears. Yes, and uh, you. Your father has taught you everything he knows. So you're just about to go off and uh, I think learn from. From the oh, best yes, you could find. Just before I leave the country, we go on a sailing trip around because there's a whole lot of uh, glacial fjords around Alaska, and my, we were living on a sailboat, which is the boat that my father ended up sailing back to New Zealand. Anyway, we I we were on this four week sailing trip around parts of Alaska, and we pulled into this particular bay, and I had boat fever. I had to get off the I had to get off the boat, so I got the kayak off the back and <coughs> I paddled ashore. And I was going to go for a walk along this beach, and um, I couldn't quite get on the sh- couldn't quite get the kayak on the shore without getting my sh- my shoes wet. So I said, "Oh bugger this! I'll I'll find another place." So I just got the the paddle out and started to ease myself off because I had grounded the kayak. And I'm just trying to get the, the kayak off the, the rocky bottom when behind me there's a rustle in the bush, and out rolls a grizzly bear cub about this big just like a bowling ball out of the bushes just wow. out on the beach <laughs> it sort of shakes itself looks up and then there's another little ball that comes out so another another cub comes rolling out and falls onto the onto the beach how far away uh 15 meters behind me wow and then i'm, and I'm thinking okay there's two grizzly <laughs> grizzly bear cubs. I, I'm stuck on the beach because I, I can't get off. Probably the worst thing you want to see. Like you can see yeah. a bear, but you see cubs. Two cubs, You're and then trouble. Mama Bear comes out, and she doesn't roll out. She just bulldozes her way out of the bushes and an, sort of stands out on the beach. She knows because they got they got bad eyesight, and the only thing that saved me was I was downwind. And I'm thinking, what am I going to do here? I'm stuck on the beach. So I just get the paddle, oh, and I try not to make any noise, and I'm just trying to ease the kayak off the, off the bottom. And I do that, and I'm afloat, and I think, okay, what am I going to do now? Am I going to start paddling and make a noise? And I just put the oar into the end of the water and just slow, and she's sniffing the air. She oh. knows that she's... Something around. She's, I think she can see me, but she's not, gonna have a, she's not having a go at me yet, because between me and her is the two grizzly cubs. Yep. She's doing that calculation yeah, in her head. Do I yeah. need to go into? Do I need to go? Do, do I need to defend here? Yeah, going into. So she's. Crazy I can. S- I can see this, and I'm looking over my shoulder, but at the same time, I'm just slowly. I'm not trying to break the water too much, but I'm just slowly getting away from the beach, and I got away from the beach far enough to I thought, okay, I'm safe here. And then Mama Bear and, and the, <laughs> the two cubs walk 
past where I was grounded and they continue on their way and I thought, oh, thank God. So I paddle back to the boat and I get back on the boat and I decide to look up the area because uh, the marine map from where, we, where mm. we're anchored and the, the marine map says we're, we are anchored in Bateman's Bay. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And there's a little sidebar as a, with a paragraph. It's called Bateman's Bay because the National Park was called John Bateman and right. they found his ankles in his boots on that very beach. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> He'd been eaten by a bear. <laughs> you wouldn't even got naming rights if you got <laughs> in, mate. Like, that's gone. So you even just found your boots. Yeah. Wow. So from there, you decided to get some more. Your father gave you some advice of if you're going to do this. Learn from the best, Don't which is good advice for anything we do. Yeah. Just learn, uh, learn from the best. And uh, so he, he had a, a rock climbing friend back here, uh, Robert Jasewski. Um, who was an outstanding, is still an outstanding rock climber. So I contacted Rob and he took me under his wing for a little while. And then I did a mountaineering course in New Zealand uh, and climbed for several summers in New Zealand. Uh, and that sort of got me my mountaineering experience. Mm. And then I wanted to go to the Himalayas, but it's such a huge step from New Zealand climbing to Himalayan climbing where you got high altitude uh, and, and at high altitude is, is, is deadly if you don't treat it with respect. Uh, and once again, I decided, well, you know, I need to learn from the best. So I asked a friend of mine here in Brisbane who, was, who were Australia's best mountaineers because in those days there was no internet. Yep. There were a couple of local mountain or rock climbing magazines, but if you didn't know, if you weren't in the inner circle, you just didn't know what people were doing. It's not part of our culture in any way no, in, no. As, in Australia. And, and in fact, there's probably, even back in those days, there's probably only four or five Australian climbers who were, you know, climbing in the Himalayas. Mm. And two of those climbers happened to be uh, Tim McCartney Snape and, and uh, Lincoln Hall. So I found out who they were and what they were doing and uh, I wrote a letter to Tim to say, look, I'm only a beginner. Would you consider taking me on my on your next expedition as some sort of... Himalayan yep. apprentice or cub yep. of the wolf pack, if you like. Um, I didn't get a response from Tim, <coughs> so I wrote a, I wrote another letter, yep. and I got a response this time. And he said, "Yep, yeah, we're going to the Himalayas to um, a peak called Changabang in northern India." And this was nineteen eighty May nineteen eighty one, I think. And he said, you can come along. And I was delighted. Uh, I, so I went along, and to cut a long story short, we got to camp two or three on the mountain and got uh, had to abandon the climb because a storm came in right. overnight and we were trapped at the high camp for two or three days and we were lucky to get off the mountain without being avalanched off. Um, but I just saw, well, this is Himalayan climbing. This is normal. Yep. Um, and I couldn't wait to go again. And then you went back to do uh, Annapurna 2. Uh, Annapurna 2, Annapurna which just two. happened to be Tim and Lincoln's last training climb before they attempted to climb Mount Everest in 1984. Right. So this is 1983. And this is there's a few things that obviously the stories in your book are incredible. There's a couple of things in your book that are a bit more subtle that really appeal to me personally. Um, and one of them is to do with this trip. Um, the first is the poem at the start of the book. Um, you put a poem in there for your grandma, uh, which is uh, "Don't stand, Do in, my not grave, stand in my grave, grave and weep." weep. Uh, one of my two favorite poems. So that's mm. the first thing I read when I read your book. Mm. Obviously, it's in the opening page. One of my two favorite poems. So th- I read that, and then in the photo sections is a photo that you took of, of uh, Tim and Lincoln on on top of the bus in going through. We're the all pool, on top of the bus. All on top of the bus, <laughs> sitting on top of the bus. And going through to Pokhara. Mm. And it's one of my f- most fond memories in my life is sitting on top of a bus making that trip. Mm. And a few years ago when I was going through chemotherapy, there was a part every time when you'd go in and you'd get the chemo. And, and it was that kind of anticipation that, you know, you're going into chemo. And I had this thing in my chest where they had to pump it in straight into my chest because it was going to rot all my veins in my arms, this chemo. And... And as I, because I was so young, I needed my veins. If I had a car accident, they need to pump some stuff in. So they put a, th- a thing in my chest. So every day I'd go in there um, and I'd go in there twice a week, uh, twice a, 
once a fortnight. Mm. So, and they'd put this thing into my chest. And I'd sit there, and it was a horrible wait while I connected this thing. You sit in the chair, and it hurts. And then they get this big bag of like bright red poison. It's poison that they're going to put into you. You sit in this dark, dank little room, and they put that on. And you watch this thing just trickle down this tube going straight into your chest. And so I used to sit there, and I used to get this sort of queasy, like hot flush feeling just going, this isn't, this yeah. isn't natural, this isn't good. And so I used to picture, I used to sit back, and I'd picture, there's my best mate. On top of a bus, we went to we went to Pokhara to do to paraglide around Fishtail Mountain. Mm. This was <coughs> maybe fifteen years ago. Uh, we're both sitting on the on the top of the bus, sitting there on top of our bags, driving through on the side of the road with narrow road. The bus drive was going way too fast. Way too fast as they normally do. Uh, there's a hundred meter drop off into a, into a gorge. A, a gorge down there, and if the bus moves half a foot that way, we're all gone. <coughs> So we sat on the bus and we giggled like schoolgirls for the whole trip up there. You're surrounded by this this vista of mountains, snow-capped mountains. There, were, there was such a sense of freedom yeah. in that moment. And so I'm flicking through your book and get to the photo section. There's this photo of you and the other guys, all young, the same age as I was yeah. when I went there, yeah. sitting on that bus. And it, it reminded me so much of that image of, in my head where, and I still go to that place uh, but it, when I was going through chemo, that was my spot. I sat on top yeah. of that bus and yeah. I just sat there. And it, it had a venture running through my veins, yeah. so much freedom in my life. And it was just – so they're the two things uh, in your book that just really stood out to me, apart yeah. from all the amazing adventures. But anyway, mate, well, I imagine sitting on a bus here <coughs> on a in, a, in Queensland. <laughs> on the roof, you'd be sunburned and heat Well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be. I mean, the police would be after you straight away. <laughs> yeah. like, workplace health and safety. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but just, yeah, those roads are crazy too. And we had to stop uh, two or three times on that journey because uh, there was obviously a big crash and a lot of people had yeah. died. They come round these blind turns, mm. full speed, a bus going that way, a bus going this way, two rickshaws going that way, a truck full of gravel that can't break. And yeah. it's all... And this was, you know, maybe 2007, around that time. It wasn't definitely wasn't 1983 when you were there, mate. So what was it like, Nepal, in that in that time, in the in the 80s? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it was certainly third world country, and some people would say it still is, which is I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think uh, I think it's good in a way, but I've certainly noticed a lot of changes. I mean, when I first went to uh, to Nepal, um, particularly in the uh, the tourist area of uh, of Kathmandu, a place called Tamil. Um, there was only sort of one Western restaurant that you would eat at, mm. and all the rest were just locals. And I can remember some of the local restaurants; they still had a a dirt floor, and they'd be cooking the meals on a kerosene stove over in the corner. And the the roof was so low that, as a, a tall Westerner, and I'm not very tall, you'd have to duck to walk to your table. And that was sort of a typical Kathmandu uh, restaurant. And then, of course, there was a place called Freak Street, which was where all the drug, the Western drug addicts hung out and yep. bought their hash cookies and what have you. And uh, yeah, and yeah, just just. I mean, there was no. F- I don't think there was even telephones in those days. You couldn't call home. Um, it was a black market, so. They were art, they were very keen to get US dollars, so mm-hmm. you dis- disappear down some sort of narrow. When we're going on an expedition, we'd have all of our expedition funds in in US dollars or yep. travelers' checks in those days, and we disappear down some sort of dark alley to some little hideout down the back where we'd change all of our travelers' checks and US dollars into local rupees, which would actually fill our day packs with rupees and then walk back out in the main street right. with no one aware that we're carrying uh, a backpacks full of rupees. Wow. Uh, and, that's, and then we'd just go on an expedition and each day we'd be forking out bundles of rupees to the porters and buying local prod- produce along the way from backpacks full of rupees. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And did you ever get in any trouble? Like no, nothing, nothing whatsoever. No, I, nothing, had. never mugged. The porters didn't go, hey, hang on, is he carrying a giant backpack full well, of money? Well, ca- they, knew they, were, they knew we were carrying money. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. But they had no idea where it was, and that was their art, was to fool them as to where the money was coming from. Yeah. Right, wow. 
I never, I've never even thought about that in those expeditions because we had to pay our porters here, and we had to pay the porters there, and get food from this place. To carry that many rupees, you need a backpack full of money. Well, you need more than a backpack. You need a few backpacks. Wow. <laughs> All right. So you're on Annapurna too, and you're with a couple of very experienced climbers. Yeah, Tim and Lincoln, uh, t- t- Tim McCartney-Snape and Lincoln Hall and Greg Mortimer and Andy Henderson. And you don't end up summiting. No. And they do. And mm. did <laughs> explain that. And did that put a fire under your belly to to go a little bit harder or further? Um, Yes and no. Um, Tim, who was the expedition leader, always said that I was coming on the expedition as uh, an apprentice. And and I understood that and so did everyone else. But I secretly hoped that if I did really well, (laughs) they might actually let me go to the summit. And um, I experienced the same troubles... Uh, with cl- uh, climatization, as I did on my first expedition. But because Annapurna 2 was such a long expedition, I not only experienced these same problems with acclimatisation, but I was on the climb long enough that I actually acclimatised really well after the, the lead-in and found that I could go quite well right. at altitude, right. just as well as the other guys. Right. So I actually got up to the high camp, Camp 3, at 7,000, I'm guessing, 200 metres, 300 metres, 7,300 metres. And so the summit was 7,950 metres approximately. Uh, And I was really hoping that we'd all go to the – five of us would go to the summit together, but Tim said no. Uh, And, you know, with hindsight – uh, because I had, I didn't have the experience that they did, and it was really going to be quite committing from the high camp to the summit and back again. And although I was really disappointed at the time, um, it, with hindsight, it was the right decision. Yep. Um, and I, res- I respect that decision. But it, what it did, Annapurna, what Annapurna two, two did do for me was prove to me that I could go well at altitude once I acclimatised. Were you surprised or were they surprised with how well you went on your first kind of, on your apprenticeship kind of I was expedition? certainly surprised. I don't think they would have noticed that much because they were focused on right. the, the challenge ahead, was, which was to get to the summit. Because right. this was their last climb um, before they went on to Everest. In fact, it was such a long, drawn-out climb that we were reported missing to the Australian Embassy in Kathmandu. Bear in mind, back in those days... We had no contact with the outside world. There was no s- internet. There was no satellite phones. Yep. Um, the only way to contact the outside world was send someone out and right. and wow. tell them. So there's no help. There's well, there's no help on any on, on and that, there's no help on any ex- expedition. Yeah. And that's the way it should be. I mean, if you're going to do these things, then it's, it's on your it's on your head. It's yeah. up to you to yeah. to get back to safety. And so an expedition like that, how long was Annapurna from the time? Obviously, you've got to get from Australia. There's a whole lot of prep that's got to go into it, which takes a long time. But from when you leave Kathmandu Mm. to go, we're going to try and get to the summit, and by the time you get back to Kathmandu, how long is that Mm. period roughly? Um, I have actually forgotten about Annapurna too, but I'm I'm thinking it's probably at least nine weeks. Nine weeks. We ran out of food at base camp. So we all descended from base camp, nine thousand. I remember it was nine thousand feet in one day, all the way down from base camp to the nearest village, and we purchased with our bags full of rupees, um, <laughs> potatoes, <laughs> rice, <laughs> beans, sugar, powdered milk, and tea. And then the next day, climb nine thousand feet. All the way back up to base camp with nothing to eat. Wow. And it's one of the hardest days I've ever put in into the mountains. And that's saying something. And then, that, then we went back up the mountain from base camp to camp one to camp two to camp three. Wow. And because we only had local produce like beans, potatoes yep. and carrots, they froze. Right. And sometimes when you freeze vegetables, they, they don't <laughs> yeah. last. They don't when they when you try and cook them, they just turn to mush. Uh. And they did. Ugh. Wow. 
But that gets me onto uh, a climb after this. Kenchenjunga, I'm going to pronounce that right. <laughs> Kenchenjunga, um, which kind of defined your life in a very big way. Mm. And a story that I'd love to hear in as much detail as you're willing to tell. Okay. Um, from the very start, mate, when, the, okay. when did that idea come into your head? Because uh, you read this book and it's <coughs> all about the expeditions, but from anything and anyone that's done anything in their life, there's a lot of time and effort that goes in just to a, afford when you're a young man to, to buy plane tickets, to buy the gear, to get over there, to, to get the... There's just a whole lot mm. to go into it before you go and do something. So when did that idea pop into your head and take mm. it from there? Okay, so we come off Annapurna 2 uh, and Tim, Lincoln, Andy and Greg are going to, going, to going to Mount Everest in the next year. And I, once again, I was sort of secretly hoping that they might invite me. But the invitation didn't come. And I thought, well, okay, what am I going to do? So I started trying to organise some expeditions to small, modest peaks uh, in the Himalayas, which uh, I did do, uh, six and a half thousand metre peaks, which I did a couple of those. And then I wanted to keep, I wanted to keep the momentum going. And then, st- oddly enough, I get a letter from uh, a fellow called Peter Hillary, which is a son, was the son of Ed Hillary, saying he had a permit for Kanchenjunga, which is the world's third highest mountain, which he didn't want to use but he wanted to sell it to someone. And I thought, oh, that's why is he contacting me? That's just out of my league. And then I thought about it for a couple of weeks and then a month. And I thought, well, I st- and I started to do some homework. And again, there's no internet around, so you've got to just look up climbing books and see what you can find. I thought, well, <coughs> the only way I'm going to get ahead here is to start doing things myself instead of ask, waiting for other people to invite me on their expedition. So mm. I thought about the idea of organising my own expedition to Kanchenjunga, as incredible as that might be, to the world's third highest mountain. Mm. How old are you at this time? I'm going to guess about 25 or 26. Um, so mid-20s. Yeah. And so I thought, well, how am I going to... You know, I need a team. Mm. So I started asking people who I thought might be interested. And to cut a long story short, I think I end up with a team of four or five, including myself. And off we went with no idea. And it was, and it turned out to be just to get to the base of, of Kanchenjunga was a one-month one walk. Wow. So walking, walking for every day for 26 days just to get to the bottom of the mountain. Wow. And then you've got to climb it. Wow. So the, the logistics of something like this is just huge. I mean... And you've got to carry everything. You've got to carry everything because we are one month's walk from the end of the road. If we run out of a box of matches, we can't light our stoves, we can't eat, we can't drink, there's no corner store. There's no walking down to the village. And like there's no walking back down the road, down the trail, yeah. to find some. You've got to walk a month. <laughs> so so wow. the, the, the planning for this, the logistical planning for the materials and the equipment. That's an, that's an expedition in itself. Yeah, it, it took at least 12 months for me to get my head around this. And so did you have help while you were here in town? No, I didn't. I had no help. So I you're had, and I had no idea. You're doing this in Brisbane? Doing this in Brisbane. And wow. so not even anyone... Did you have someone on the ground in, in Nepal? That no. you can oh, yes, yes, yes. Sorry. Yeah, yeah so, um, so any expedition going to Nepal needs an agent. Right. So I call them an agent, and, pa- and that's probably not the best description, but they need to be licensed with the Nepalese government to operate as a travel agent come expedition trekking organiser. Yep. And uh, I, I found one, and he he was the same one who did our Annapurna 2 logistics and planning. Mm. His name was Nima, and I contacted Nima and said, look, I'm... I want to organise an expedition to Kanchenjunga. So he, he organised all the ground logistics, yep. but I had to organise everything beforehand. And then, and we were doing it on a <coughs> shoestring budget, and it was just. It's a yeah. massive undertaking. Yeah, and it was too much, too soon for, for inexperienced guys like myself. But sometimes when you jump on the deep end, Correct. If, if things go right for you, 
you learn a hell of a lot, and I did. And so did you get some people to come on board with you? In terms of t- teammates? Yeah, teammates. Well, yeah, yeah, so I had a team. I think I, there was five of us, so four other guys. Four other guys. And what was their experience level when you... Uh, less than mine. Less than yours, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I'll cut a long expedition short. Uh, we spent weeks climbing, inching our way up Kanchenjunga, Camp 1, Camp 2, Camp 3. We find three of us eventually, three of the five get to Camp 4. And it was... When was it? It was May. May... But May 1986, and we set off for the summit, and I'm going to cut it short by simply telling you that the two guys that were with me, they turned around, I think, because of exhaustion, and I kept going until late or mid-afternoon, until about 2.30, when I sort of... Because if you're, if you're climbing in the Himalayas, one of your first job as a climber... Your first priority as a climber is to manage the risk you're exposing yourself to. People think it's all about getting to the summit. And it is, but it's sort of second or third priority in your list. Your, your first priority is to manage the amount of risk that you're exposing yourself to. And I'm sort of calculating the risk. I'm going higher and higher up the mountain. I'm getting further and further away from my teammates. Uh, and there's no one between our, my teammates at Camp 4 and Base Camp. So we've got to, if we've got to get down, we've got to get from Camp 4 to Camp 3 to Camp 2 to Camp 1, back to base camp. And then we've got a month walk out in the road. So our safety line is being stretched to the maximum and yep. it could break at any moment and we're all going to die. So at about 2.30 in the afternoon, I realise I'm really stretching this safety yep. line to the, min- to the limit and it is going to break and I'm 200 metres below the top. Oh. And I thought... 200 metres. And I'm just sitting there, I'm standing there in the snow, thinking, you know, what am I going to do? But fortunately, I'm, I'm, a, I've, I'm a cautious person playing a very dangerous game. Mm. And that's what saved me. My, my cautious approach <laughs> to life, although you wouldn't believe it, I <laughs> uh, said, no, it's time to turn around. The risk is unacceptable. Yep. And we turned around and got back to base camp safely and... And eventually back to Australia, uh, and uh, it was really playing on my mind that I got so close. Mm. So after I got back to Australia, I sort of, it took me a couple of weeks to recover, maybe a month, and I thought, well, actually in the meantime, I forgot to mention, I've also been selected for an Australian Everest expedition, Mm. leaving for Mount Everest in 1988, which is, you know, perfect. But this failure to climb Kanchenjunga was having an effect on me and on my self-confidence to go on Mount Everest in 12 months' time or whatever it was, 18 months' time. But once I recovered from the first attempt to try and climb Kanchenjunga, I thought, well, why don't you give it another go? But the logistics, as I've just mentioned, for an expedition this size and, and so remote... It takes you 12 months just to organise the amount of matches you need yeah. 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 and the number of tea bags, And how are you going to carry it? And how are you going to carry it? And how many porters do you need? Uh, so I thought, well, instead of taking a big, uh, you know, five or six, why don't you just take one other person? And I ha- already had this person in mind. His name was John Colton, who I'd climbed with before in the Himalayas. Right. And so I knew John well, and I said, John, you want to come? And he said, yep, without hesitation. And the other good thing about John was he was a doctor, a GP. Right. So perfect. Handy. So, yeah, we, uh, we set off for Kanchenjunga in uh, the monsoon season, June. So the monsoon in Nepal is June, July, August. So we set off in the middle of the monsoon in about August of 1987. And it takes about 28 days to get to base camp because of the monsoon. Because it, uh, it rains easy, every single day. Easy walking and hiking to get to base camp. How difficult was it just to get to the base camp? Well, the monsoon made it extremely difficult. In fact, it, it added a couple more days because we couldn't get to the end of the road because the landslides had cut the road, so we yep. had to get out of the vehicles and start walking up this road around landslides. It was just pouring with rain. Everything that we were carrying, the porters that had, were carrying our supplies, everything was saturated. Jeez. How many porters do you take on I that, think actually? on this one it was 120. Wow. 
Oh. And then uh, every couple of days you, you pay off a couple of porters because you've, you, you consume so much right. food and fuel that there's no longer a necessity to have them on board. To have that many on board. So each couple of days you're paying off a couple of porters to head back. Right. Uh, but even so, I think we arrived at base camp with probably 110 porters. Wow. And then once you, once you get to base camp, you pay them off and they disappear. Yep. And you hope they come back in two and a half months' Help time. You, you know, a, a, a select maybe 20 or 30 come back in two and a half months' time. Yep. But, but you also have your base camp staff, which is normally a cook and a couple of kitchen boys who look after you, uh, cook all your meals while you're at base camp. So there's only a few of them. So the main – all the porters go – once like you reach base camp. Once yeah. you reach base camp and there's the cook and a few helpers around. So there's, you know, maybe a group of five of you or ten yeah. of you there. Right? Um, so John and myself and uh, a cook and two kitchen boys. Right. And, and just so I, I'm being ignorant here, but base camp is essentially your own camp. You get there and set it up, right? Yeah, it's in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Uh, it's generally around about five. It's generally at the base of the mountain. It's. You need it to be where there's a, su- a supply of, of running water because we don't have enough fuel, kerosene, for our stove to melt ice right. to make water for the duration of the climb, which is about 11 to 12 weeks. So we need running water just to keep our f- fuel consumption down, yeah. down to a smaller amount. And we also need to be at an altitude where we're going to acclimatise, but it's not too high that we deteriorate. So there's only, uh, humans can only live at a certain level for a certain right. amount of time. And, uh, and in fact, I'd probably go so far as to say you could not live at base camp forever. Right. Your, your body would deteriorate to a point where eventually you'd probably die. Right. Okay. So you've set up base camp. Where do you go from there, mate? What's, what's the next thing? <laughs> up. <laughs> up and up and up. Up and up and up. Yeah, so we set up camp one. Camp two. And you, but that takes time. It's it not like you time. just, oh, hi, all right, we're here. We set up camp here. We're going to hike up there. You need to acclimatize. You need to, I guess, plan your next little mini expeditions to get to that point. Yeah. So we ha- so once we, once we get to base camp, we have to spend uh, probably four or five days just allowing our bodies to uh, uh, adjust to the, to the altitude uh, yeah. because we've reached 5,500 metres. You've just hiked giant bags of money through <laughs> through a monsoon too. That <laughs> uh, we had to dry out all our money <laughs> um, and matches and matches. Uh, and then, so we've got this supply of equipment that we n- that we need at Camp One, Camp Two, Camp Three, and Camp Four. And there's only two of us that can get it up there. And so we work out what we need on the mountain, and then we start carrying it up to Camp One. And we generally start off with carrying 20 kilograms each up to camp one, and we go up and down in one day, next day up and down, until we get everything that we need on the mountain at camp one. And then we can go up there and start living. Right. So camp one was actually a snow cave. Okay. Yeah, so we dug a hole into the side of a a bank, Mm -hmm. like a little round three-quarters of a metre tunnel into this bank of snow. And then once we got in a certain distance, we dug it out to a, a, ca- a, a cave, so the size of a size of um, a s- really small room, maybe three meters in diameter, and that's where we lived at camp camp one, and we brought all of our supplies into that snow cave. Right. The good thing about a snow cave is, is regardless of the t- of the time of day, it is zero degrees. Right. Mm. So it can be. And, and and in the middle of the Him- in the Himalayas on halfway up Mount Everest, uh, it can be incredibly hot mm. on a perfect day without the wind. Right. It, it can be twenty to thirty degrees Celsius, and you really feel it because c- it's bouncing back at you from the snow, and you get you get sunburnt in places you've never been sunburnt before. So you, you don't, op- you know, you you get sunburnt on the roof of your roof of your mouth or inside your ears or up your nose. Right. Wow. It's, it's just reflecting. It's like bouncing a back. Wow. At you. Um, so I've always always enjoyed s- staying in snow caves because it's zero degrees and they're soundproof. There could be a raging blizzard outside, but you wouldn't know. Oh, right. really? But Camp 2 was a, a tent. So once we get all the supplies at, ca- at Camp 1, we then can start moving them up to Camp 2 and then Camp 3 and Camp 4. Fortunately for us, the further we go up the mountain, the, the less we have to carry. 
So at Camp 1, we'd probably try and have a week's supply of food and fuel. Okay. Camp 2, we'd probably have three or four days' supply of food and fuel. Camp 3, we'd probably have two or three days' supply of food and fuel. And Camp 4, it's basically an overnight camp and you're carrying the bare, bare minimum from Camp 3 to Camp 4 because Camp 4 is what we refer to as sort of the, the summit push. So right. you really only want to spend a night or two there before you go to the summit. Right. How long does it take you to go to, to build those three, four kind of camps? Uh, we were allowing uh, a week each. So we were allowing four weeks to get to Camp 4. Right. And then we had a, a contingency for bad weather of about two weeks. Right. Yeah. And that's with all your supplies and everything yeah. like so that. So six weeks before we could get our... So that's what we were working on. Six weeks to get ourselves in a position to go for the summer. Right. Did that all go smoothly for you up until uh, that point? I believe so. We certainly had our fair share of bad weather. Um, or we had to come back down to base camp yep. because uh, it was no use sitting up at camp two, camp three or whatever, uh, trapped in bad weather, consuming food and fuel that you had so carefully carried up there. So if you can get down, yep. if you think the weather's going to go on for a few days, it's no use staying up there. If you can get down without being avalanched, uh, then you get you come back to base camp. And obviously, the higher you go, the quicker you deteriorate as well. Sorry, the higher the higher you go, the quicker you deteriorate. Yes. Like so you've always got that in mind, but you also need to keep in mind too. You want to acclimatise for going to the summit, and right. because it's such a high summit at eight thousand six hundred metres, or twenty eight thousand two hundred feet, you really need to get acclimatise well. Otherwise, you're right. really treading a, a very dangerous game about going too high too quickly. And the elevation gain between these, so, so between like two and three, is it a, a big distance? And, and it can vary. There, there was a big distance between, I think there was six or 700 metres between base camp and camp one. There wasn't a great deal of altitude gain between one and two. But there's a big gain between two and three and a big gain between three and four and then a big gain between four and the summit. And there's a big difference when you're trying to acclimatise that, that 600 metres, that 500 metres. I've never been that high where I get altitude sickness. Is there a big difference in your body and the way that you feel between a 500 metre gap between that altitude? Yeah, so the, the body has an amazing ability to adjust to altitude if you give it time. Right. And the secret to acclimatisation is time. And patience. Right. And if you try and cut either, either, either of those two short or you have a shortage of either, yep. then you, you're starting to uh, play a dangerous game with altitude. Right. So you've got the four camps set up. You've been there for, you've done the 26, 28 days hiking. You've done another four weeks to set up your four mm. camps. With another two weeks for contingency, contingency. of bad weather. How so are you going to make your summit attempt? So that brings us into the early part of October, uh, which is what we were planning. And in those days, we had no weather forecasting. We just had to guess. Yep. So once a spell of, of bad weather finished in early October, we thought, okay, the bad weather spell is finished. It's probably going to be, it's fair to say, it's going to be good weather for a little while, so let's go for it. So we did. So John and I went up from base camp to camp two in one day, camp two to camp three the next day, and then camp three to camp four the following day so that brings us up to the 9th of october right with the idea of going to the summit on the 10th of october which is we d what we did and there was a lot of deep snow around on summit day so we started early in the morning of the 10th of october there was a lot of deep snow around so our progress was extremely slow uh making our way up the, the summit slopes to Kanchenjunga and then we'd get out of this gully just on about 5.30 in the afternoon. We should have been heading back down to Camp 4 at this stage but we're getting really close to the summit. And then we get into all these large rocks and boulders which we try and zigzag our way through and then we, eventually I get to, we get to the summit at quarter past six on the, uh, on the evening of the 10th of October. So the sun is just setting. Wow. And you can wow. really feel the cold. You can wow. really feel the cold just seeping into your bones. 
And and by this time you would have you would have left very early in the morning. Yep. So you would have left at two. We've been or going all day. All day. Yeah. You're not consuming food at this altitude. I think, or had, I think I had a litre of water with me and maybe a Mars bar or a muesli bar, but I probably I don't think I I think I'd pretty much consumed my litre of water and I hadn't touched the uh, the Mars bar. So little food, little water. You've been hiking in really tough conditions yeah. all day. Yeah. You reach the summit take as the sun's going down. Yeah, take a couple of photographs and then just get the hell out of there. It's scary. It's it's really intimidating being on this incredibly high mountain at that time of the day, knowing the sun's going to drop. And it's going to get dark. And it's going to get dark, and the temperature is just going to fall out of the bottom of the thermometer. Wow. And you still got to get back to camp. Forward. And you got no idea what the weather's going to do, really. No. You're just guessing. So, how'd you get down? Uh, gee, uh... So John and I separated at this stage because <coughs> we got to a certain point in our ascent where I've gone one way to the summit and he's gone the other way, which means we should reach the s- summit at the same time, but we didn't. So I'm coming down and I'm still expecting to see John, but I, I realise he's gone a, a different way around a pile of rocks, so he's gone around another s- pile of rocks, so I've missed him. And so well, he I'm wasn't even at the summit with you. Like no, he, so no, you got up before because him. we're you know we're only fifty or hundred meters apart. Yeah, but that could represent forty five minutes in in yeah, time. Right. And then he he so on that final hour or so of the climb, because there's so many rocks involved that I could go around to the left hand side of a rock and he could go around to the the right hand side of a caravan sized rock. So mm. we could we miss each other. Yeah, sort of. If that makes sense. Yeah, perfect sense. And then I come down and that's exactly what's happened. He's gone around one big rock one side and I've gone around the other. Yeah. And we've missed each other. Right. And so I'm continuing down and I get to the top of this rock face because I've come down a different way. Number one mistake, always descend the same way as you come up. Yeah. First lesson my father taught me. But I'm... I'm a big boy now. I'm on the world's <laughs> third highest mountain. I'm going to take a shortcut <laughs> and I'll get myself into trouble. This shortcut leads to the top of a cliff. And I thought, oh, I've messed this up. And I start, I try and down climb this cliff. And I get halfway down. And I thought, no, I can't do it. Oh, God. So I've climbed back up again. And it's dark. <laughs> oh, my God. And I've, 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 and I thought, okay, you just killed yourself. Because there's no way you can get y- down this. You're thing. thinking this. St- halfway up a cliff. Yeah, uh, on top of the world's third highest mountain. Wow. It's night time. Wow. And, you're and I, I said to myself, you should have listened to Dad. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and how's your body and your mind at this time? Because the fatigue's got to be taking its toll. Yeah, the fatigue's there, but it's been there all day. Uh, and the thing that I noticed was just how incredibly cold it was getting. Just how incredibly cold. Because we were climbing without oxygen. And if, when you're climbing with oxygen, it's like fuel. So you, if you're climbing with bottled oxygen, you're actually warm. Right. Yeah. So your body's burning that, metabolising that oxygen, yeah. I guess. and that's. But if you don't have it, as I was to find out many, many years later when I was guiding on Mount Everest, when I was using o- oxygen and it did run out, right. It was when it ran out, it was like someone put a garden hose into my climbing suit and, and turned it on. Cold right. And freezing cold water started to fill up right. on my boots. And that's what it feels like. Wow. And is that that's obviously some me- metabolic thing? What what do you know what that why that is? Is yeah, it? Yeah, well, ox- oxygen is a fuel. Yeah, okay. And and, and if you if you burn the fuel, yep. which is what we do, yep. you create heat. Right, right. So if you're on bottle oxygen at four, four liters right. a minute, yep, you're burning. You know, you burn. So that's that creates heat. Yeah. But if you're on, if you're using, if you're not on bottle oxygen, then you've got a far far less than four liters a minute, mm. and that's why. I was so incredibly cold. Yeah. And what what was the temperature? Do you know? Oh, no idea. Who cares? I mean, it's yeah. so <laughs> <laughs> when you when it gets that cold, it doesn't figures don't matter, right? Uh, because it's so dangerous that doesn't matter. It is just so dangerous. It just it doesn't matter. So you're at this point, Mike, and you've you've come down. You realise that you've made a mistake. You haven't seen your climbing buddy in a while. The sun's gone down. It's dark. 
you've taken a wrong turn, you can't get any lower. What's going through your head? Where do you go from here? Well, I thought, okay, what's what? How am I going to get out of this? And there was two answers: climb all the way back up the mountain to a point where I could get back onto my ascent trail, which I I knew where that was. But when you can just, my progress was ten steps, and then I was breathless. Wow! And then it would take me a minute and a half to catch my breath. Mm. So that's that's what I've got. You know, it's right. going to take me probably an hour to get back up to my ascent trail, even though it wasn't that far, because mm. I, could, I could barely do 10 steps. The alternative was to try and get down the cliff that I had tried a few minutes earlier. And and how, how, sorry, just a, another ignorant question. How are you doing this? Is it, it like you're on ropes? You're on no, like there's nothing. You're nothing. Just you're just gooching down with your hands in your feet. Yep. My God. And wow. the answer, well, the answer to me at the time was to try and get down this cliff without falling off. Wow. And what the worst part about this cliff was, not only was it vertical, but un- directly underneath it was a slab of rocks that were about 45 degrees. So if I fell off, uh, there's no can- chance of surviving the fall. If I did survive the fall, I'd land onto this slab of rocks at 45 degrees, which would shoot me straight over the edge. And you knew this uh, from climbing up? You knew where you were? No, I knew, I knew, no, no. I knew this from the fact that I tried to get down a few minutes. I tried to down climb this cliff a few minutes earlier. Right. So and the you saw what was there. Like, and okay. saw what was there, and I ran out of handholds and footholds. But you've just decided. So you've decided that's your other option. Well, I decided that I can't. Cli- I can't. Po- I don't have the energy to climb all the way back up wow. to try and reach my wow. original ascent trail. So you're going to try and down climb. So again. I'm going to try and down climb it. So I take off. I had four pairs of gloves on. I take off the first two pairs of gloves, so I've got some feel. But in doing that, I'm really exposing my hands to frostbite. But I've got to hang on. Mm. Um, I'm going to cut it short by simply saying that I I got down, scratching and scraping on the rock and and just hoping that every little handhold... I mean, we're only talking, you know, handholds you know, a centimetre wide. With gloves on? With with two glo- pairs of gloves on. Wow. And, you know, sp- uh, metal spikes hanging off the end of your boots. Uh, anyway, I got wow. down. So you got John had more sense than me. He's He came down the way that we climbed up. Anyway, so I took take the shortcut. So <coughs> and I, I, I eventually get back to our original scent trail. So wow. I join up to our original scent trail. And I thought, okay, you're on right. safe ground here. St- wait for John. So I'm sitting in the snow, it's now dark, or almost dark, and then I started to notice that I couldn't focus on anything. And I thought, oh, look, no, it's just, it's just dark. The light's playing tricks the light's, on me. The light's playing tricks on me. Then I sp- try and test myself by putting my hands in front of my face. Jeez. And I think, no, nah, there's something wrong here. I can't even see my own hand. There's still a little bit of ambient light around. I thought, oh, you must be, you, the altitude's getting to you. Must, this could be cerebral edema. You need to be careful. And then out of the darkness stumbles John. And I think, oh, thank God. He's made it to the summit. He's got back to me. And we, we're on track now. But I say, to John, I say to John, look, John, I think there's something wrong with me. I can't see properly. And he said to me, and I'll never forget this. He said, yeah, I've got the same problem. <laughs> <laughs> So we're losing our eyesight pretty quickly, not to mention the fact that it's the sunset. And so is this yeah. where the blood vessels in your eyes, the back of your eyes, start to pop because of the pressure yeah. difference? Yeah, so it's called retinal hemorrhage. Thankfully, Jeez. John was a doctor and he said, I, I thought I was losing it. He said, no, oh, this, this is probably what's happening. It's called retinal hemorrhage and it's because of the extreme altitude. And it's where the blood vessels in the back of your eyes burst because, and because of the atmospheric pressure, the difference in between the uh, atmospheric pressure and the pressure in the back of your eyes. I also had a bleeding nose, which means that the tiny tiny blood vessels at the top of my nose here had burst. They're all bursting, right. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, so we both lost our eyesight. <laughs> and we're two... You feel a little better knowing that that's what it was and you weren't just losing your mind? <laughs> Marginally. <laughs> but the situation is we're only... T- 150 metres below the summit of the world's third highest mountain. <laughs> We're both <laughs> as blind as bats. Um, <laughs> and the, the temperature's dropping at the bo- out of the bottom of the thermometer. And we're a miles from our Camp 4. Miles? Oh, 
it might wow. as well be. Yeah. Wow. 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 So we start. So we decided. Okay, we've got to. We can't sit here because we'll freeze. We can't see where we're going, but we've got to keep moving. So we just do our bit the best we could, and we try and sort of feel our way down the remainder of the mountain, which we did a fairly good job under the extreme conditions. And then I was in front at one particular stage and I just started falling. And I thought, oh, God, I've got just walked over the edge. Just tumbling, you just started tumbling. Just tumbling. And then uh, fortunately it didn't last long and I just land in the snow. And I, I, I think I probably fell about eight or ten metres. And what had happened was I'd fallen into a crevasse. And that crevasse, you know, is just a... You know what a crevasse is? It's a, yep. a crack in the ice. Yep. Yep. And, um, and I thought, oh, well, <laughs> I haven't died just yet. <laughs> <laughs> but then I started to fall off this ledge that I was on. Right, so you start sliding off this ledge. Yeah, because I haven't landed well or properly. Wow. I mean, I can't see, so it doesn't really matter. It's dark. It's dark. And I'm falling even further off this ledge. And then it only takes a fraction of a second to, f- to figure out I still got my ice axe strapped to my wrist. And I stick the pick of the axe in the a- into the snow or the ice as it was to st- stop myself sliding any further off the ledge. Uh, and then I was able to call my way back onto the ledge and then gather my composure. And then, uh, you know, I still can't see, can't hear John. So I thought, okay, where the hell am I? So I sort of feeling around and I feel this face, this vertical snow and ice face in front of me and there's nothing behind me except air. So I thought, okay, well, I better try and climb this this face, this face of snow and ice in front of me, but there's no handholds. <laughs> so I get my axe and chop out some letterbox style <laughs> hand holes that I can oh stick my, my hand God. into. Yep, yep. And that's how I climb out. Chopping yep. out these hand holes. And I imagine it just sort of I get to the surface and there's John, not that I can see him, but he can hear me, sitting on the other side of the crevasse. So you've climbed up the wrong side. I've climbed up the wrong side. Oh <laughs> he's on, no. I'm on one side, he's on the other. Oh, no. And I say to John, oh, I think there's a crevasse between you and me. Because <laughs> <laughs> I just climbed it. So I just fell into it and climbed up the did other he, side. Did he know you'd fallen in? I think he did because he'd been calling out to me. But, I, you know, he, I couldn't. If you fall into it, uh, like I said before, those snow caves are soundproof. So I'd literally fallen into a big hole. And he, could, he was. He, I think he might have been calling out to me, but I couldn't hear a thing. What a frightening experience for both of you. But for mm. I, I imagine him, you and your mate, are struggling back to camp, and then all of a sudden, Mike. Yep. Mike. Mike. Yep. You're sitting there. I can't even imagine what goes through your head. You just go, oh shit! Mm. Like as he just walked off the edge. Yep. Is That's that probably it? what he thought. That's it's that's it. There's going to be a million things going through your mind. Do I God. wait? Do I wait for him? Is he, is he gone? His like mind, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> do I wait here? Like, I, I can't and wait I, here forever. I, to this day, I mean, and this is 30 odd years ago, I, I don't know whether he saw the crevasse or he couldn't see it, but did he did he, did he put his ice axe? Because you climb down with your ice axe and you f- we were feeling with our ice axes yep. and whether he put a, his ice axe into the hole, the, the crevasse, and thought, oh, there's a hole there. there. And, that's, and that's what stopped him. From following me, following falling in after me, wow. but then you know, so he's on one side of the crevasse and I'm on the other, <laughs> and I say, "Look, John, there's a crevasse between you and you and me," and he said, "Yeah, I think that I think you're right," and I, f- so he has to backtrack and then carefully, very carefully, find a way around this crevasse, and he did it by poking until he had solid snow. And it's it took took it seemed to take forever, so I'm not going to even try and expand on the story. But, but eventually he comes around to my side of the crevasse, and I I think I just said, look, this is a dangerous situation. We could be into a, in a crevasse field. Yeah, this whole thing could happen <coughs> again, and we won't be so lucky. So we r- agreed 
and so we just chopped out this these this this seat or bench in the ice and sat there all night. Wow. And you obviously knew that comes with huge risks in itself. Yeah, once you stop moving, you're exposed to the full forces of, of, of Mother Nature, which you know, I don't even want to contemplate how cold it was. And that, and the, the, the one of the side effects of being extremely cold is you become very drowsy. Mm. And just want to go to sleep. And just want to go to sleep. So we're sitting on this ledge and all you want to do, because of the hypothermia, is, is just nod off. But you know, the amount new experience t- tells you that if you go to sleep, you're, you're not going to wake up. Uh, but it's a, it's a, it's t- it's a tempting... Yeah, it's a yeah. tempting path. Yeah, to follow, especially once you've 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 done all that physical exertion all day. Mm. You haven't eaten. You haven't. And your body's just going, mate. You just need a little sleep. And you'll yeah, be fine. Yeah, have just little, have a little have nap, a little and sleep, it'll be morning Mike. when you wake yeah, up. Yeah, you've yeah. you've earned you're warm, it. Warm. The sun will be up. You've earned it. <laughs> so you've spent the night, you and John, on this ledge. Was it the longest night of your life? Was it the most challenging? I have a very good sense of direction, and. Yeah, so the night just drags on and on, and I stand up and I do star jumps without falling off. And I'm thinking to myself, just to try and get some circulation going, and I'm thinking to myself, the tent is around here somewhere. My inner compass says, yep. we're, we're really close, but the other part of me says, look, don't even bother trying because you could just go straight over the edge. So we get through the night, and then w- with when dawn comes... We still had this retinal hemorrhage, which we, we, we had for another week. But when dawn came, it was like looking through a frosted windscreen of a car. So I suddenly had, compared to the night before, I suddenly had light, but it was a greyish light, like looking through a, f- a frosted windscreen of a car. And I could see John, he was just a blob of red. because That's the colour of his climbing suit. And he could see me. Did you have pink? Not on Canton Junga. I had yellow. Okay. I did have pink much <laughs> later <laughs> on. Good 80s colour. Fluoro pink. Um, anyway, so I could see these two blur. Oh, I could see this blur of red. And then off some distance away was a blur of yellow. And it didn't take me too long to figure out, but it was our tent. Wow. 50 metres. Wow. From where we spent the night out in the open. Wow. <laughs> so what, what did you do from there? Did you just crawl said, straight in John, there to for a sleep? look at that. And he said, oh, is that the tent? And I said, yep. <laughs> so I stagger over to this tent and I crawl inside and I'm thinking John's right behind me, so everything's <coughs> going to be okay. But we're both away with the fairies. I I think I crawl into my sleeping bag and I fall asleep. So John doesn't. He comes up to the tent, has a brief discussion which m- with me. He's hallucinating. Yep. So he never has this. He has a discussion with me, but it's, I'm actually in my sleeping bag <laughs> in the tent. <laughs> And he's, I think he says, oh, should we keep going, Mike? And I say, yes. So he, off he goes, heads oh. down to Camp 3. Now, we still can't see. Yeah. But what we can see is this ocean of white, which is all really blurry, but what we can see is this ocean of white in this, and this black wiggly line. And John figured it out first, but I was to figure it out later that that black wiggly line is our ascent trail. Right. And that's a shadow because if you, you're walking through deep snow, you leave a trench. Right. And there's a shadow that forms off the yeah. I- in the base, in the bottom of the trench. Yeah. But at midday, no shadow. there's no shadow. Anyway, John rightly and accurately thinks, well, that's the way to Camp 3 and follows the trail all the way to Camp 3. Right. He gets to Camp 3 and he says, Mike, should we keep going? And I say, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm still this a camp positive four. guy, Mike. Yeah, Mike's asleep. always <laughs> back in my ideas. I like that. And he keeps going into camp two, and of course, by the time he gets to camp two, he's dropped a great deal of altitude, and his senses come start to come back yeah, to him. Right. And then he realizes the conversation he's been having with me oh, haven't existed, right. and I'm not following him. Right. 
So he is panicking, but he there's nothing he can do. So he spends yep. the night at camp two. I wake at, up at some stage at camp four and think, well, where's John? Yep. He's not up up, up behind me. He's not yep. up the mountain. He's not down. So, Well, he must be down. So I hurriedly pack my sleeping bag and head off to camp three. And it takes all my effort just to get to camp three. And I get to camp three at uh, just on sunset. And there's no one there. So I have no choice but to spend a night at camp three. Nothing to eat, nothing to drink. And it was a very, very long night at camp three. So you still hadn't, you still hadn't eaten anything? No. Wow. Mind you, that I, don't, I don't recall being hungry. I, I do recall being thirsty, really right. thirsty. And what about the cold? Like how... How setting is the cold? You were in your sleeping bag, obviously, for a bit of a sleep earlier. Does that warm you up, or are you just chilled yeah, to the bone? It, it warms you up, but I noticed at Camp 4 <coughs> that uh, everything was uh, was warm except for my fingers and my feet. Right. And I'm thinking, oh, okay. I haven't taken my gloves off. I haven't taken my socks off. And I really struggle to get my feet into my sh- boots. But I've got to keep going. I'll deal with that when I get to base camp. Uh, and so I spend the night at Camp 3. And then the next morning I pack my sleeping bag. And I, got, I, just, keep, so I, just, I keep saying to myself, you've got to get off this mountain. I don't know where John is. I hope he, I'm hoping he's below me. And I abseil the ropes back down from camp through to camp two. And I nervously approach the tent at camp two, thinking to myself, what am I going to find here? An empty tent, a tent with a dead body in it, a tent with John in it. And as I peer into the tent door, there's John. And he says to me, oh, g'day, Mike. You're just in time for a cup of tea. (laughs) Thank God. (laughs) And uh, we have a cup of tea and uh, we just keep the stove going for as long as we can. And I don't recall whether we spent the night at camp too. I don't, I don't recall uh, what we did there. I have to read the book, I guess. Um, I think we do spend the night at camp too. Is there a bit of food and, and yeah, fuel there's, and, there's and food? food there. and and uh, I don't recall having anything more than maybe a muesli bar. We yeah. certainly didn't cook any meals. Yeah. Um, but we've got it, we both realise that we're in bad bad shape yep. and we've just got to keep going. Maybe we didn't spend the night at camp too, but we anyway, from camp two we we decide that we've got to push all the way to, to base camp. We just yep. gotta get up. We can't spend another night in the mountain. And so we push it to base camp. Uh, and I, John said to me, look, Mike, you just keep going at your own pace. We've just both got to get off this mountain. We've both got to pace ourselves. We wanted to stay together, but John said, look, I, 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 I've just got to pace myself. I'm going to stop a lot to try. And I, I said, okay, John, well, I'm going to pace myself differently to you. You know, people say, well, why did you separate? <laughs> but if you don't understand how it works, that people operate, diff- t- people have a, a a level of pace that suits them. Mm-hmm. And like, if you if you like try a marathon, I suppose. If you try and go too fast or too yep. slow, you'll you'll burn yourself out. Yep. So you, you've got to set a pace that suits you. And we both know we just got to get off the mountain. John wants to set a so- slower pace, and I want to k- keep going. At a pace that suits me, so we both mutually agree. When we we both feel that we can safely get down, yep. all we have to do is get to camp one, and there's a line of ropes that lead all the way down right. to base camp. And from camp two to camp one, there's not too much danger involved because there's not too much altitude gain. So it's it's a it's a low level descent, if you like. So we both felt comfortable with separating. Yep. I get to base camp mid afternoon, and John gets to base camp. Um, Probably about five o'clock in the afternoon. Yep. And then for the first time since the summer to push, we take off our gloves and our boots and then we discover we've got all this frostbite through fingers and toes. And it's really not looking good. And we've got a one-month walk 
from base camp to the end of the road. <laughs> and there's no way we can do it with these frostbitten feet. So what does a frostbitten foot look like? When you take off your shoes, what do you see? Is it all just black? or In the early stages, it's purple and blue. Right. But you can't move your toes because they're frozen solid. If you moved, you try. If you tried to wriggle your toes with your fingers, you'd snap your toes off like pencils. Oh Jesus! So it wasn't looking good, and then it, as the days progress, after you get frostbite, it becomes light blue to purple, and then it goes all black, like the colour of your t-shirt. Wow. And the pain slowly increases and during the, and that pain? The, the pain doesn't increase. The pain increases from the area around the frostbite. Right, where the nerve endings are still yes, kind because of frostbite is just like a burn. Yep. You have first degree, you have second degree, and you have third degree. Third degree means the cells are dead, right. whether it's heat or cold. Second degree, and I'm not a doctor, so I'm just talking basic principles here second degree it's like sitting on a fence yep the cells can go either way they might recover they might die first degree the cells will recover yeah so i pretty much had the first third of both feet at third degree frostbite because they turned all black uh john's feet weren't too bad he had black uh black big two big black toes and a couple of toes either side of the big toe but he had lost a couple of gloves on his right hand, a couple of pairs of gloves on his right hand. So his right hand had frostbite uh, quite badly. And as a result, he would lose the tips of his uh, index finger and... Middle finger. Middle finger. Yep. The first joint and half of his pinky or little finger. I had frostbite on my right hand, uh, which was quite bad second degree so my fingertips were black back to about here wow and as you can see my right thumb was black back to the to the joint here and yep. subsequently i would lose about 10 millimeters yeah. off the end of my right thumb right and i have no thumb print on my right thumb right so uh but the rest of my fingers were fine so you're at base camp and your feet are, are you've discovered this you can't walk around base camp, can you? No. It's not like you can stroll to, to use the bathroom or anything no. at this time. So we have to have our base camp staff carry us to the toilet because we can't walk. And neither can we walk the, the one month out to the road. So you're pretty much just laying in your tent at this time. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we had to get rescued, which was... Uh, we had uh, a cook and three kitchen boys at base camp. So we asked one of the kitchen boys to go out to the end of the road and find a radio or a telephone, radio our agent, Nima, in Kathmandu, and see if he can arrange for a helicopter to pick us up at base camp. <coughs> so off he goes. And he's got to run. He's going to run yep. this one month walking in a week <laughs> every day he's going to run 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 and then just camp in a village <laughs> that oh night God. get up early next morning run 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 the next day anyway he gets to a village that's got a phone or a radio i don't know which and, and then if he trips and breaks his leg along the way and disappears that's that's you done well more well we've got a feel for him too yeah, I mean, yeah of course because he's uh, in the middle of nowhere yeah you know we can survive at base camp for a little a bit longer what sort of terrain is it that he was going through. Rugged. And bear in mind that on s in the last few days, the last week or so to get to base camp, we had to build our own bridges across rivers because that's the only way we could get across these rivers. And when I say bridges, it's just a, <coughs> a couple of sticks. or It's a couple of logs yeah. that have fallen from one side of the, cr <laughs> the creek to the other side. Wow. And they're slippery and there's no ropes and you just wow. got to get across them without falling off. So he's run off and it's got to a town. Cold? Super cold? No. No. Uh, well, in the, in the first couple of days from leaving base camp, it would have been cold, but he would have run the, he would have run that distance. So he would have got out of the cold in the first couple of days, right. in the first day or so, and got into the forest. Yep. 
And so how long are you at base camp and when do you first hear that he's made it? Or So not only does he have to run out and, and radio Catman do, he has to get clear a clear clarification or message to come back. Mm. And so he does. So for thankfully, my our agent Nima in Kathmandu says, yes, I'll arrange a helicopter. What time do you think it should come in? Because he's still got to go back to base camp to tell us. Yeah. So we he, estim- he, esti- he estimates the time and, and then everything's agreed that the helicopter will come in on this day. And then he turns around and has to come back to base camp, which he does. And he, he says to me, yep, the helicopter's coming. So, but we're too high for a helicopter pickup. We are talking the 80s. Yep. So helicopters can't fly much higher than 5,000 metres, let alone stop and pick up two, two climbers. Mm. So we have to descend. To, to a an agreed rendezvous po- rendez rendezvous point, wow. which he's agreed a week prior. Yeah, <laughs> which is a, you know a couple of thousand meters yeah. further wow. down the valley. Wow. Okay, that's fine, but John and I can't walk, so the cook's going to carry me, <laughs> and the kitchen the other two kitchen boys are going to carry John. So we've got to leave base camp the next day with the bare minimum of supplies. Yep. So I literally, I'm, I'm dressed in my thermals, top and bottom, long, long thermals, and a down jacket and a beanie, and these big oversized slippers, if you like, because my feet are in bandages. Yep. John's much the same. In uh, pa- and you're in pain. Yes, in pain. Uh, we've got a bit of morphine with us, because John, being the doctor, had some morphine. Yep. It took the, took the edge off the pain, I think, from memory. Um, and I get my camera, my exposed film, my passport and my wallet, and it goes in a little pack on my back. Yep. And off the next day, off we go. What about your bags of cash? I don't think there's much left by then. If, uh, yes, yes, there wouldn't have been much left, but we took what cash we had, but it, it wasn't much left. And off we go. I'm getting carried, and it's it's really rough terrain. It's it's not smooth. It's yep. boulders, and so I, I, my poor the poor the poor guy carrying me is falling over, and his legs are going down holes, and mm. I'm thinking, oh, this is this is bad. At about lunchtime on the day we left base camp, it starts to snow, and it doesn't stop, oh. <laughs> and it just keeps snowing. And it keeps snowing to a point where we're not going to get to the rendezvous point. Fortunately, we've got a tent. We've got two tents. And our lovely base camp staff put up a tent and chuck John and I in it. And they go in the other tent and they've bought a stove. And the snow just keeps falling and falling. And just before sunset, just before, yeah, just somewhere during the night, about 7 o'clock at night, they come to our tent with some soup. And I'm thinking, this is incredible. We're in a blizzard and all they care about is us. Then they bring us some rice and what they call dal, which is like a light curry made out of lentils. John and I couldn't eat much, but we really appreciate the effort these guys have gone to. Yeah, above and and beyond. That's Above above and beyond. And it is a blizzard. Yep. That's kindness. Uh, and it it became known as the October Storm of 1987. It just caused havoc. It's a big storm when it gets its own name. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a big it's storm. A, anyone it? talks about Octo- the October Storm in 1987, they know it. Right. Because it dumped metres. Wow. In fact, so much snow fell that night that when we when John and I became aware that it was w- morning, we were completely buried. Your tent's completely under it, And our tent stands a metre and a half high. <laughs> wow. And we're buried and we can't do anything about it. And I have no doubt that even today that we would have suffocated if we hadn't been acclimatised to 8,000 metres. Yeah, right. Yeah. And we could, and then we start hitting the walls of the tent because our, our base camp staff are also buried. <coughs> oh, God. But they were able to keep their tent partly uncovered right. 
throughout the night because they could do something about it. We couldn't because we couldn't use our hands. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm sort of bashing the side of the tent with the back of my hand, but I've got a pocket knife in my, cli- in my jacket. But you can't use but it. But I can't open it. Oh. <laughs> now I'm thinking, will I break some teeth trying to open this pocket knife? Because uh. I can't, I, John can't use his hands, his fingers. I yeah. can't use my fingers. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm staring at this pocket knife. And then John takes over the bashing on the, the inside of the tent to let us staff know that we're buried. But then we start to hear them digging. And then, of course, the more they dig, they they find the top of the yep. tent, and they yep. dig down to find the door of the tent. And when they open the door of the tent, you just hear this—you can feel this air <laughs> rush yep. into the oh, tent. Wow! So they, they literally pull us out of the tent, and uh, yeah, another day. That and alone is an ordeal. And then you still got and we're we're buried in meters of snow. And I'm thinking, okay. And the clock's ticking at this time too, isn't yeah. it? Because and this is the day the helicopter's supposed to arrive. It is. And I'm thinking, okay, this is really dangerous. I can't allow my cook to continue to carry me because we just got to get out of this. So I start walking. We but we all we all start walking. John starts walking. I start walking. And the worst thing you can do with frostbite is refreeze. Right. What's already been frozen. And you don't have. You can't put boots on. Well, I've got these slippers on. Yeah. So the the three base camp staff do the best they can. They are literally ploughing a trail through the snow, and John and I are fall, uh, following as best we can. And they do a fantastic job, but we just plough our way through the snow all day, and we don't even get to the rendezvous site. We're not even close. So again, the staff set up the tents, put John and myself in one and there and the others and at, at 7 o'clock at night comes the bowl of soup. But isn't that the day the helicopters were coming? That's the day the helicopters were coming. So you... you the helicopter was coming. You thought this time you, you've missed it or...? And I, no, I thought, well, looks like we're going we're gonna to have to walk a one month to get back to the... Oh. Oh. On these feet of mine and John's. So we got through that night. It was incredibly cold but the snow has, is not falling. It has stopped falling. So we get up the next day and we pack up and the, 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 the staff are out the front breaking trails through the snow. And then I say to John, did you hear that? He said, oh, what? And I thought, and I said, oh, it sounds like a helicopter. He said, no, I didn't hear it. And then, but we, we listened and I said, John, a helicopter coming and he said you were right and then over this pass flies this helicopter wow straight out of the top of us didn't even see us and continues up the valley oh no (laughs) (laughs) and john and i just look at each other and said god that's just our luck (laughs) (laughs) and then i don't know whether john i think john it was john's idea he said oh Let's let's stamp. Out, we've got all the snow around us. Let's stamp out a big H in yep. the snow. And fortunately, we were fairly close to a relatively flat, exposed area. Exposed area. And we stamped out this big H, and we can see the helicopter up the valley looking for us, just going around in circles. Yeah. In the main, uh, so we stamped out this big H, and I had a red jacket on. And I took it off, and John had a jacket on. And our staff are with us. And the helicopter comes down and we're waving out my red jacket and John's waving his and the staff are going yahoo and carrying on and the helicopter goes straight over the top of us. Oh, no. Man. But then as we see it come down, go down the valley, maybe a kilometre, it turns around oh. and makes another sweep and goes right past us again. <laughs> and then goes up the end of the valley to base camp and then turns around and comes back down again and sees us. So third time lucky. And it's, it's, it's hovering around, so at least it can see us. And yep. then it can see, the, the pilot can see the H in the snow. And then he comes down for a landing and he lands. But at this, at, this is at extreme altitude. This is at still at extreme altitude. So we're at the maximum pickup point for a helicopter. Right. And this helicopter has Struggling. landed. But it's literally shaking itself to Trying pieces. Trying to stall. It's stalling and the fact that it's going, the rotors are spinning so hard. 
that it's 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 almost like it's going to stall. Is that because yeah. the air is thin? So thin. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, and I, I get in, and the co-pilot, the pilot says, and points at my pack, and I think, oh, okay. So your photos. Photos. That's what I was most concerned about. Uh, exposed. First thing I thought about. Exposed <laughs> yeah. film, camera, passport, wallet. Yeah. He says, no, nah, out the door. So I toss it out the door. John gets in with his pack on, out the door. And then we're just sitting there in the back of the helicopter and it's, it's just shaking itself to pieces. And we, I, I was really scared that we're going to crash. And I must admit, 20 metres off the ground, I thought we were. And it's just... But we get off the ground and we go down the valley this narrow valley, and as we go down the valley, there's cloud coming up, and we fly straight into this cloud. Jeez, does it stop? Man? And I'm thinking, this is how we're going to die. We're just, we've just we escaped the clutches of Kanchen Jungle, but we're just going to fly straight into the side of the, <laughs> the valley. And so he turns around and comes back out of the cloud. Right. Because he can't, he can't fly can't in the cloud. See, yeah. Jeez. And I'm thinking, okay, we're going to run out of fuel now. Oh, my <laughs> God. Jeez. Um, and then we're just circling around and around, and then he sees a gap. He, he, he gets a, he gets a glimpse through the cloud that there's a, you know, and to his credit, he flies straight through it, and we do fly straight into cloud. But he must have an idea of where he's going. We break out the cloud on the other side, and then we we just sort of break out into through the storm <sighs> to a land side. that I haven't seen for two and a half months, which wow. is green trees. Wow. Um, you know, villages, corn crops, rice crops. Yeah. Uh, it's this is you know up in Kanchenjunga. It's such a sterile environment. Nothing yeah. lives, nothing grows, and suddenly you burst out of this ocean of cloud. Yeah. And here's an, here's a, a, another world. Wow. Wow. And then we land at this pre-arranged village because he's brought a, fl- a, uh, a supply of fuel in with him, and we're yeah. about to run out. So that he had stashed all his fuel at this village on the way in, just these plastic containers. He'd also dropped off the co-pilot there because he knew that he was picking us up at the maximum height and that any extra weight was going to be a difference between getting off the ground and not getting off the ground. So the the co-pilot was down in this village. Who is this guy? He's a legend. Yeah. Yeah, What a guy. He was a friend of my agent's called... My agent's friend, Nima. So this this pilot was the brother-in-law... Right to my agent Nima, and that's the only reason he went that extra risky for him. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. wow. So we land and they refuel, and um, the co pilot gets back in, and we fly back to Kathmandu, which is another two and a half hours away. And then you still, I'm sure the story goes on. Oh, it goes on, it goes on, and then that obviously nowhere. That changes. So we have no passports. Yeah. <laughs> and they're not going to return. Yeah. That changes your life forever because you come back to Australia. You obviously get back to Australia. You have... Uh, well, no, there's more to it than that. So we've right. got no passports. Right. The Australian embassy's closed. Right. So this is where the value of a, 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 a good agent and a true friend comes in. He calls up the, the Australian embassy and says, look, I know you're closed. But I've got these two Australian climbers who've got serious frostbite. They need to get back to Australia as quickly as possible. And um, so we, he arranges 24-hour passports for us. Uh, I don't think I even went to the embassy. So that just shows you uh, how good and trusting the Australian ambassador was at the time and yep. how good my agent Nima was yep. uh, that I would to, to get a 24-hour passport yep. to get back to Australia. And then we had to get on a plane. Um, and John was flying back to Melbourne and I was flying back to Brisbane. So we actually left, Ka- we separated in Kathmandu. And I had to spend two nights in Bangkok. So I flew from Kathmandu to Bangkok. Must have been itching to get home. Oh, I was in agony. I mean, I had to find a hotel. <laughs> and, and get around? Oh, I couldn't get around. Yeah. I had these black... Claws, the fingers. Everyone was looking at me suspiciously. Uh, anyway, I got this room fairly close to the old Bangkok ha- airport, and all I could do was get room service. And they'd literally open the door, put the tray on the little because 
the f- after the first person arrived with room service, and I unfortunately had a, uh, I must have had a visa card. Oh no, John gave me two hundred two hundred US dollars. Right. He, I had no money. John had some money. He gave me two hundred US dollars to get home. So I was using this money to to pay for room service. But after the first time they delivered room service and they could see these black feet and these black hands, they must have thought I was a leper. Because they'd knock on the door, I'd say, come in, and they'd put it on the on the little bench just immediately immediate wow. inside the door and leave as quickly as possible. And could you even eat? The, like, how could you feed yourself? I don't know. I, 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 I don't, to this day, I, I must have sort of, you know, balanced it somehow between yeah, my hands. Just got um, it done. And then I had to call the airline to say, look, I can't get from the hotel onto the plane. So they thankfully arranged for it to be picked up, for me to be picked up. But uh, in those days, um, so I was catching a 747 back to to Brisbane. It was chock-a-block and they had a little hole, they had a holding bay for this particular flight going back to Brisbane Mm. and it was chock-a-block full of passengers and they brought me they brought me down this ramp on this in this wheelchair in front of 350 people with black hands and black feet and everyone is staring at me jeez i i didn't i i wanted to hide but there was nowhere to hide and because i was a wheelchair uh, passenger, they will me past these 350 people onto the plane and put me in my seat. Jeez. And then the two people who came and sat next to me, <laughs> <laughs> I felt sorry for them. But I was in smoking section too. In those days there was smoking on the plane. Yeah. Yep. Did they yep. ask questions? They, they did. Like they said, like what, happened, what's to what's happened to you? What happened to you? I said, don't worry. Were they Aussies? I think they were. Yeah. I said, don't worry. You c- I'm not contagious. You can't catch it. <coughs> Wow. And have you showered in this time, mate? Like yes, I did. I did. Yeah, yeah. So did that um, hurt, like you know, when yeah, like, yeah, it would. It's cold when you have a hot yeah, shower. Like, yeah, like And we know, we all know what economy seats are like. Yeah. So, and I was in smoking section. It would have been you. You're more. You're not still on morphine at this point. Uh no, the morphine had run out. We had nothing left. Uh, and I, I, after a couple of hours, I had to get up because it's a twelve-hour flight back to Brisbane. I had to go up and sit, sit on the toilet, put the toilet seat down, sit on the toilet and put my feet up against the door because my, they were aching that much. And, and I, for hours and hours, I sat in the toilet with my feet up against the door and people were banging on the door. I'd like to swear, but I, I won't <laughs> swear. But So, yeah, that's how I got home. Oh, God. Wow. What an ordeal. Wow. I don't. I don't even know what to say to that story. When I read that story, now that I've heard it, it's a. It well, it's the first time I've heard it, and I'm just like, I can't. I don't know. Mate, what to do. That's chapter three in the book. As oh, that's chapter three, mate. <laughs> read the whole thing. There's another ten chapters after that, and the stories aren't any less wild or impressive or outrageous. And then uh, that, to me, that's phenomenal. But what happens after that when you come back to Australia and you don't just go, "I'm never mountain climbing again." You, you obviously the fright scope bite has to get dealt with. What happens from that point, and your whole life is reshaped, but you don't stop. The determination doesn't stop. I'm sure it takes a huge hit, and you talk about that in the book. Where obviously, if you're in your in your twenties and you go through an ordeal, you know that's a mental challenge beyond mm. belief. But you also have the physical challenge. Talk me through that side of it, Mike. Well, it's going to take hours. It is going to take <laughs> hours. I know, and I know we've gone through so much already, but you lost the front third mm. of each foot mm. when you come back, mm. which means you can't stand, you can't walk, mm. you can't drive, mm. you can't do anything, let alone mm. hike up another 8,000 metre peak. Mm. You had to reteach yourself mm. how to do. Learn how to walk again. Everything. Mm. Was that the most challenging part of your life? Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, I obviously went on to climb Everest and people would think, 
without knowing the background story, well, that's that's probably your biggest personal achievement, and I can understand that. But learning how to walk again was far harder than uh, than climbing Everest, uh, even without oxygen, and it's something I still deal with today on a regular basis. Which you know, having said that, it it gave me the utmost respect. Um, for other people in our society, in that we we really get caught up in putting people on pedestals and sporting heroes, and you know the word hero is thrown around so much these days. But the fact that I was pretty much um, unable to walk for so long really gave me a great deal more respect for those people who are less fortunate than everyone in this room, um, who through no fault of their own, either illness or accident. Uh, uh, are forced to, I guess, climb their own Everest every single day of their lives um, in hospital or at home um, due to misfortune or or whatever. That is my favourite part of the book is the climbs are impressive, they're amazing, but to know how much of a struggle and and not to know firsthand by Mm. any means how much of a struggle that would have been to get your life back on track mm. and get your strength and independence mm. back for anyone. Like you said, anyone going through an ordeal like that and millions of people go through it every single day of their life, that was the most impressive. Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the thing that I'm most proud of with my life. Um, I knew when I started mountain uh, mountain climbing, high altitude mountaineering, that there'd be f- very few uh, rewards or benefits. Uh, but I did receive the Order of Australia for, for my... Uh, success uh in climbing some of the big peaks which i'm I'm actually you know very honored and pleased by but you know everest was easy in comparison to learning how to walk again and yet so you know, just, a, just sort I, of i know why i could talk to you for 17 days mate to get all your stories but just to give everyone a quick summary of of what happened after this amazing story so it took yourself a while to get the strength to 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 walk again um, and to, to mentally go, right, I can, I can do this again. Um, and at the start, we said you've, you've climbed the, the six highest peaks in the world without oxygen. Mm. The story you just told us was peak number one. Mm. So the five after that, mm. including two Everest summits, happened once you've retaught yourself how to walk mm. and stand. And you're talking in your, about it in your book to pee, to be able to stand up and pee without falling over, to go from that to I'm going to summit Everest Mm. twice. And then on top of that, on top of all this, and there's heaps of, I'm sure there's heaps of other ventures and heaps of other (coughs) things in there. In, uh, was it 90, 90, in the autumn of 91, you're in an avalanche Mm. on Everest. Can you just quickly talk me because I, I <laughs> just just really quickly. No, there's no such thing as as quick, Steve. Uh, mate, in this it, story, this is the other story that is a lot has happened to this point. On ninety in 1991, in spring, you tried to get up Everest, couldn't get up. Yeah, there. so yeah, so um, we are really cutting along. Uh, we're, we're cutting, cutting a lot out of this story. Here. Yeah, okay, so we we'll, we'll go to. And so I apologise to everyone listening because... We, go ra- we could do round two of this. Right? Oh, man, we could do round 146 <laughs> of this. Trust me, I, when I research into this man, the stories are endless. Um, sorry, so 1991. Let's 1991 just was my big year. I had uh, taught myself to walk again. And I was t- <laughs> trying to teach myself how to climb. So what better way <laughs> than to organise an Everest expedition? Of course, of course. Of course. Yep, so I organised an Everest expedition for the spring, northern Northern Hemisphere spring of uh, 91, and I think there were six of us, and let me see, I'm going to cut it short by telling you that we we got to Camp 4, which is about three quarters way up the mountain, on Everest in the spring of 91, but con- consistent bad weather shut us down. Mm-hmm. So... I was making my way back to Australia via Kathmandu. Now, you can't just go and climb Everest any time you feel like it. There's a permit situation uh, in place and there's actually a government department called the Mountaineering Section. So on my way back to Australia via Kathmandu, I thought, well, I 
I'm going to try and climb. I'm going to apply for another permit to try and climb Everest. And I went into the mountaineering uh, section and said, "I'm here to apply apply for another permit to climb Everest." And I fully expected that my application would take a couple of years right. to come to the top of the pile because back in those days, Everest was really strictly controlled. It was only a couple of expeditions per season allowed on the mountain on the Nepalese side, and there's only two climbing seasons. So I was expecting a long wait. Anyway, uh, on this particular day, I was in the right place at the right time. The Nepalese gentleman on the other side of the, of the desk said, well, you know, there's just been a cancellation for the latter half of this year. An Italian expedition has cancelled their permit. You can have it. Here Would it you is. like it? And I said yes, nice. right then and there on the spot, not knowing who I was going to climb with or anything about it. And also the logistics involved, yep. with probably a four-month turnaround. So, yes, I went back in September, October of 1991 with three Sydney climbers plus myself. So a four-man team on Everest is, is really small. And it was very hastily but very well organised. Uh, I am going to cut another long story short here. I understand. We understand. So uh, we've got to keep pushing the route forward forwards or upwards uh we're at camp two and uh we're getting supplies at camp three and we're working together with a french team on the mountain at the same time and the french leader comes over to us and says look we need help to fix ropes from camp three to camp four it's a re- it's a reasonable request to 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 put in uh because we're sharing the same route and the same ropes as the french team so I, I said to my teammates, I'll, I'll volunteer to help the French team tomorrow to fix ropes from Camp 3 to Camp 4. So, but we're all, we're all at Camp 2, but the French team's at Camp 3. So I tell the French team, I'll leave Camp 2 very early in the morning of the 20th of September. It's a day that I remember really well. And I'll meet you at Camp 3 at 6 o'clock in the morning and together we'll work up to camp four so i leave camp two at two o'clock in the morning and make my up climb up to camp three it's pretty straightforward considering there's ropes in place i meet the french guys and we s- split up the ropes we've got to fix about 800 meters of rope between camp three and camp four yep. and um at about 10 30 that morning we're three quarters way up to camp three at uh, camp four the, 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 the French climbers are just underneath this rock face, but I'm down the slope a bit, about 30 metres, uh, when I see an avalanche coming. I thought, oh, God, this is the last thing I need. But then I quickly figure out, OK, the contours will take it over to the left-hand side. And I think, yep, that's OK. So I relax. I yell out to the French guys, nothing to worry about. Yep. The avalanche is going to the left. We're right. And then... Um, as I'm looking up to the French guys, this avalanche pounces over. The, it literally pounces like a, a two-metre wave just appears from nowhere over the top of this rock cliff. A, a, like a part of that avalanche that you didn't <coughs> see. It's the same avalanche, but wow. I couldn't see it because it's oh, on a different a contour. Oh, and that, there's a rock wow. face above us. And it, it pounces over these French guys, and they're underneath the rock face, so it just goes straight over the top of them, and it's coming straight for me. Jeez. These guys are in the barrel. They're in the barrel. I'm not. <laughs> Who's about to hit the wall? That's a good way of putting it, actually. Yeah. You're, you're just They're in the, the barrel. You're, They're you're, out in, you're in the danger zone where you're just going to get pumped. I'm in the it? I'm in the bullseye. Yeah. And this is happening split secondy here. Oh yeah, because the avalanche has moved so fast. It's probably moving at about 120 kilometres an hour. And what noise does an avalanche make? Well, it, it was so fast that the noise was behind. It was was behind it. So the the, the yeah, the wave was travelling in front of the noise. Wow. That's how fast it was moving. Wow, and you're just attached on the side I'm of the a, mountain. No, I'm, a t- I'm tied to a rope, right. which has a braking strain about two and a half or 3,000 kilograms. Right. And I think, okay, I'll just duck. <laughs> what other moves do you have at that point? <laughs> but it hits, hits me with such force that climbing up just goes, snaps like a piece of cotton. And my mouth... The, the force just drives, fills my mouth with snow and ice. Even though you're closing your mouth, like obviously. I think like, even though I've ducked. Oh, my God. It just just jammed in my mouth like a big rag. And 
you know, there's no way I can breathe. And then the rope breaks and I just go flying. The impact just blows me backwards through the air for about 30 metres. And I thought, oh, this is how you're going to die. <laughs> and it's going to be really painful because <laughs> I know where I am on the mountain. Yep. And I know where I'm going. And there's no escape route. And I just go backwards through the air and I thought, God, I hope this is quick because I, kn- I know what's going to happen. And then I fall back into the avalanche and then the noise catches up to me and it's just horrendous. And then the, the force of the avalanche, it's blocks of ice, like bowling ball size blocks just bashing into you and you're just tumbling, you know, through the air at about 100 metres a, oh. a leap and then hitting the, 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 the side, the, the ground or the slope with such force, you think every bone in your body's breaking, about to break, and then you go through the air again for another 200 metres. Wow. Somersaulting, and the avalanche is around you, and it's just incredible noise and force and violence, and then it all stops. The ragdoll. Just, 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 just like... But all, all I shouldn't say it just stops. I'm saying, hang on, just try and hold your breath. Try, well, you are holding your breath. Just because you, you, I'm out of breath. I, I haven't... You actually didn't take a breath. I didn't take a breath. And I'm probably getting to, you know, 60 seconds or uh, one, one, one and a half minutes now without drawing a breath. I'm just saying, hang on, hang on. And then suddenly, the and I'm I'm just going through the air in big leaps and bounds. So is it a whiteout, Mike? Is it is yeah, it completely well, that, white? Because I'm somersaulting. Yeah, it's, it's it's sort of brilliance of white. Yeah, and then complete darkness, like looking at that curtain there. So right, but, it, but it's it's me tra- traveling somersaulting through the air, looking up and then looking yep. down through into the avalanche, then looking up again, looking down. Right, and then suddenly it just all stops. The violence, the noise, the chaos, just like a, uh, someone just flicks a switch. And I thought, oh. And I thought, okay, I'm dead. It's just because it, it just happened. It's just someone's like, I- I'm dead. Yep. And then a, a fraction of a second later, I'm thinking, uh uh-uh, uh, you're not dead yet. Because I'm, st- I get this, there's a, uh, I'm starting to feel warmth. Right. In my arms and my legs and on my face because I've been cut to pieces by ice and it's the blood coming out from all these scratches. And I'm thinking, no, you're not dead yet. You're buried alive, and you've got to figure out which way was up, which is which way is up, and which way is down. And, st- and I still haven't drawn breath. And I, I, I just want to. I, 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 my gag reflex. You know what a gag reflex yeah, is? Yeah. It's when you t- hold your breath. Yeah. Free like free diving, and then you start. You feel like you're breathing. And, 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 your and, ass. You, and, and then you give in. Yeah. Like yeah. You want to. You, you try and draw breath, and if you're underwater, mm. you draw water. Yep. Yep. And in my case, my gag fl- reflex had given in. And I'm trying to suck in air, but nothing's coming in mm. because my mouth's full of snow. So my gag reflex has given in. And I've, I've passed the stage of panicking because my gag reflex has given in. And I thought, okay, you can't, tr- you can't breathe. And I'm, I'm buried. And I think, okay, where's, which way's up? Which way's up? Which way's down? And then I see this pale blue light shining down. And I think, okay, that's, that's it. That's the surface. Wow. Can you move your arms or are no, you pinned? You're completely I'm pinned, pinned for the time being, but I also recognise if I don't move, this avalanche debris sets like concrete in 60 seconds. Right. Like super glue. Wow. So I've got to move. i just got to move. And I start moving. And I, I, I'm going for this pale blue light and I just burst out of, the, of, the, of the, the debris. And the first thing I do is stick my fingers down my throat. Just roof out the snow. And, oh. and then I think, oh, no, look, there's another avalanche coming. You know? But I can't see because my eyes are shredded with all the ice crystals. Oh, my, they're open, but um, uh, my eyes are watering so bad that I can't see. So I'm stuck in this in this path of what I think is another avalanche, and I can't do a damn thing. And I'm also in a crevasse field. <laughs> I've landed in a crevasse field. There's how crevasses far, all around me. How far is it taking you, do you reckon? All the way back to Camp 2. Pa- three quarters away to Camp 4, and I've pretty much gone all the way back to Camp 2. Wow, what oh. do you think that elevation change is? Like that's uh, a like vertical kilometre, a thousand metres. Far out, <laughs> far out. Anyway, there's no, uh, no, there's no other avalanche coming, thankfully. It was just a panic situation. Yeah. Wow. And then I think, okay, 
I can't see. So I'm in a crevasse field. And I'm about to go hypothermic because my clothes, my climbing suit's been ripped shredded. to shreds. Yep. It's been full, full of ice and snow and it's all melting. I've got to, I've got to once again, keep moving and get back to camp two because that's my only chance of survival. Yet between me and camp two, there's a crevasse field. which is like a minefield and I can't see. <laughs> I'm having a panic attack and I'm sitting yeah, here. Like, mate, uh, these stories of yours are, are absolutely endless. And the thing I like about this is you decided to keep trying to go for the summit, didn't you, after that? You didn't You didn't go, oh, that's enough for me, this climb. Is that right? You you said, hey, after a few days, obviously, of, of how making how, sure. How would you get out of that bit? How did I get out of the crevasse field? Yeah. Well, that's a long story. Oh. Yeah, it's like... It's like <laughs> It just, which obviously I survived. I mean, yeah. I survived. I'm, yeah. I'm here today, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump. I'm gonna jump. Okay. From, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I get back to camp too. My teammates are there. They take care of me for a couple of days. Uh, I say to them, "Look, I'll, I'll go down. I, I'll go down to base camp and recover. I, I need to go to base camp. They recognise that in fact. I said, "You guys keep going on. And I'll go down to base camp." And I went down to base <coughs> camp. And I spent a week at base camp to recover. In the meantime, uh, all these trekkers are arriving at base camp uh, from from down the valley, wanting to see the Australian climber who's just broken his neck and two legs and arms by falling off, you know, the side of Mount Everest and avalanche. Because uh, word had filtered down I, the I valley bet that it had. this guy had just survived this incredible avalanche. <laughs> anyway, uh, yes. So I recovered at base camp. My teammates come down for a rest. The weather's turned bad. Did they all think you were gone at that yeah, point? Yeah. They, they the were French guys are like, he's out. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's dead. He, he's, he got hit by a, a huge avalanche. Mike's and, done. And he disappeared. Just uh, that's it. In a kilometre away. Mm. <laughs> wow. Wow. So, yes, uh, my teammates come back to base camp. The weather's bad, so we're forced to spend a couple of weeks at base camp and then the weather clears. We decide to go for it. We get up to camp four. So, so injury-wise... Cuts and scrapes and... Uh, broken nose and a couple of cracked ribs and you can do nothing about either of those. No. Except go home or... Go hard. Put up with it. What, so did, you, we what did you decide to do, Mike? Uh, well, we went back up to camp four, <laughs> all of us, and... Uh, Are you kidding me? <laughs> the weather turned bad once again and uh, that was it for me. And it was the, uh, that was the end of the expedition. Wow. Wow. And... Look, we could keep going all day and night, and I'm, um, well, we've all got I, lives I, to... I, I want to. Yeah, me too, mate. But um, uh, you ended up getting up Everest in 93, mm-hmm. I believe. And then in 96, you were on, uh, at the time, the worst climbing disaster on Everest in um, Adventure Consultants. You were a yeah, guide yeah. with Rob yeah. Hall, which is very well publicised and... A, uh, there's been many books, many books, documentaries, a couple of movies. Couple In fact, the last movie was called uh, the last movie was about uh, two years ago, a Hollywood movie called Everest. Which, yes, uh, is about the the ill fated ninety six expedition. Yep. Uh, there's also a chapter in your book, Into Thin Air, is a you know a very famous. And Into Thin book. Air was a book that was, was written, as there are a number of books written um, about. Uh, this particular expedition. The the manuscript for my book, uh, Sheer Will, was written before I went to Everest in 96 and I thought it was done and completed. But when I came home, my publisher said, you've got another, another chapter to write. And so I've had to add the chapter about the Ever- uh, the 96 disaster to the end of my uh, my book. And when you watch those, do you watch those movies? or no, those documents? You don't? You just steer clear of it? And you're probably going to ask me why. Of, I can I can guess at a lot of different reasons, but is there the one that I that isn't obvious to me? Uh, well, in the case of the last movie called Everest, um, there's a couple of things. The thankfully, it's a Hollywood movie. It is. I, I watched it, and d- I don't know. Is it Universal or? Um, oh, maybe Paramount. I Paramount. Anyway, it's yeah. a bi- it's a big. I watched it after I read the book. I'm gonna. Yeah, I did so more research. The, uh, Thankfully, they had an Australian actor play me, which is... They did? Oh, yeah. Thank <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine, imagine an American trying to 
put yeah. on an Australian accent. Yeah, yeah. Thankfully, an Aust- Australian, um, Thomas Wright, plays me in the movie. Did he contact you at all? And that's what I'm leading to. Yes. So oh. he was told not to not to speak to me. Oh. Now, can you believe that? Why? Don't ask me why. He doesn't know why. Oh, I don't really? know why. But he said to me, uh, he called me up and said, look, I play, I'm play. i playing you in this up-and-coming movie. I've been told not to contact you. I don't know why, but I like to play my roles well. Yeah. I'd like to speak to you. I'd like to get to know you. Kudos to him. Yeah, and I, I, I really uh, – full credit to, yeah, to, yeah. to Thomas. Um, anyway, he lives in Melbourne. Uh, he came up and stayed with – his family came and stayed with us for a weekend and got to know my side of the story. And pretty much said, well, the Everest movie is nothing to do with, it's not about me. Yep. It's about two people. Yep. An American and Rob Hall. And in fact, his part in the movie is very small. Yep. Uh, and it's nothing like... The real part. Or it's, you know, there's not, there's not a lot of your story in it. In it yeah. so, I, so I said, okay, yep, I, expe- I expected that. Should have made a mi- I could make a movie about your, sto- your part of it, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, so to get back to your question as to why I haven't watched it is, is I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I, I watch movies to be entertained or maybe to be informed. Yeah. Now, as the only surviving guide of the Rob Hall expedition, I was in the thick of it. Yes, you were. And who's going to tell me? I mean, yeah. is someone who what hasn't been there, who's, uh, is a Hollywood director going to give me... Any insight. Any insight. Yeah, a as better to story than you already know. A better, yeah, that's a good way of summing it. Yeah. Uh, without being rude to the, yeah. to the to all involved, is anyone going to give me a better insight than my, you know? And yeah. I don't need to see anyone's version no, of what there, happened. mate. I yeah. mean, and it's, you know, Hollywood brush over, glorify, you know, all sort, there's all these words we can use that... We, we, all, we all know yeah. that, so... They, yeah. Yeah, they've got to make a story. They've, they're they're I, in I the th- entertainment business. Yeah, but I think the story is, stands on its own. They don't, they don't need to Hollywoodize it. Okay. Anyway, they, they We've can. heard one in a bit of very similar types of stories today and captivating the way they are. Captivating. I would love at some point... If you ever want to speak about that, <laughs> we won't get. We won't even touch on it today more than we have because uh, we're completely running out of time. But uh, mate, these stories are incredible. You've obviously gone on to do a lot of different climbs. A few questions that I just had floating around in my head when I read all this. Have you learnt anything unexpected from doing all these adventures? And I know that's an odd question, mm. but it, did you did you walk <laughs> away and go? I never, I never knew that, or I never knew this about life. Do you have a different? You obviously have a different perspective on life. Mm. Uh, what have you gained from from all this? Well, I think that's a hard question to answer, but I, I can honestly say that uh, climbing Everest uh, changed my life forever and for the better. And to be able to try and pinpoint exact things is it's very difficult. But I'd, I'd hate to think of my life now where it might be if I hadn't have climbed Everest. Um, you know, pretty much to say that having done all that and learned how to walk again, I have lived a fantastic life, uh, a very fortunate life, and if I took my family out of the equation, if I was told I was going to die tomorrow, there's no regrets. That is such a sign of a life well lived. It's it well re- lived. It, it really is, and I, I enjoy when people say that. And I, I say that even though uh, I've got a family to think about and I, no one wants to die, but no. I look back on my life and go, you know what, mm. I'm glad I lived it my way. So to yep. hear you say that is amazing. Um, if you could go back to the 21-year-old you in Alaska setting out, trying to forge a career in mountaineering, what... What advice would you give him, if any? Or would you just slap him on the back and send him on his way? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, gee, that's a hard one too. Um, These aren't easy questions to always answer. Always follow your ascent trail. Yeah, always. One. <laughs> Dad's one piece of advice that he gave you, n- always stick to it. Uh, Number two, if there's an avalanche coming... Duck. It's not okay. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, that's a hard one, Steve. And and there mightn't be answers to these questions, no, mate. Like I wouldn't like to. Tr- I'm I'm probably make something up, but yeah, um, yeah it's yeah, it's a hard one because I, I think back when I was 21, I had very little self confidence, um, and I, and overcoming the challenges that I have has given me a great deal of self confidence. But you know, you, you've got to earn that. You've got to. We all have to earn earn that bit to yourself. You got to, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and you know, resilience. You're not born with resilience. You know, that's something that your parents, hopefully, uh, <laughs> instill in you. And life's challenges along the way. So back when I was 21, I didn't have a lot of self confidence. I didn't know what the the word resilience mm. meant. Uh, I probably had the desire to do well. Given your experiences, I, I think a lot of people probably, you know, resilience means different things to different people. Yeah. But yeah. You know, I think I've done a, s- a small amount of, you know, putting myself out of my comfort zone that builds resilience, but nothing in yeah. that would compare to anything you've done. So, you know, it's a, it's, yeah, yeah. it's interesting to hear you say that. I, f- I would have thought that you would have had an innate amount of resilience. No, because back then I didn't know what it meant. I mean, I probably didn't have too many setbacks in my life. I mean, it's not serious ones. Yeah. And I find that a lot too, like... I come from a middle-class family mm. in a small Queensland town. <coughs> you know, life's not difficult. No. Life's not cushy either. No. Like, we're in that kind of middleman of society where you can kind of cruise on. You see it with a lot of people that you know that you grow up with, that they just cruise at that middle ground mm. and they don't know how to push for that resilience. Yeah. I would definitely wasn't mm. pushed and that understanding that if you – struggles through something and even if you push yourself harder outside your comfort zone there is reward in that and yeah there's a lot of reward in that yeah. and and i now was fortunate uh, enough to learn that yeah as time went on and i don't think if you get a, if i think if you if you don't get a taste of that reward you may always settle for that middle ground and it's only when you get a taste you know you you, you get a sense a tremendous tremendous sense of achievement and accomplishment I mean, it's a boost to your self-confidence. It's a boost to your resilience. It's a boost to a lot of th- characteristics. And then when you get a taste of that, then you think, well, maybe I could push it a bit further. Correct. And it's a brilliant feeling, whether mm. it's just like, you know, you're going for the hike for the first time and you're trying to get 10Ks and you get back and, oh, this is good. Mm. You know, it's not the top of Everest. Oh. I don't know what that feeling would be like, but, geez, I've, for the little things that I've done, I've come back feeling like the king of the world going, mm. right, What's next for me? So, mate, anyway, we'll wrap it up here. Yep. Mike, Michael Groom, thank you so much. If anyone can get their co- hands on a copy, I know it isn't in easy circulation at the moment. Sheer will and the title is so it is so aptly named because that is every chapter there is just sheer will. You think, how is Mike going to get through this? And it's just sheer will. It is the best book I read 2019, hands down, it is phenomenal. I wish everyone could hear every story that you had to tell. I'm going to try and twist your arm to come back on here at some point, Mike, and tell more story because they're phenomenal. I know you do public speaking at the moment, mate, but, mate, I just want to say thank you. It is an honour and a pleasure to hear these stories, mate. I second that. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Aaron. Perfect, mate. That's it. That's it. Wow. Thanks for listening, everyone. As you might have already gathered, I love a good story. So if you have one or know someone that's done something extraordinary and they could tell a good tale, reach out and let me know as I'd love to speak to them. Best way to do this is via the Exploration of Everything Instagram page. That's it. Stay safe and speak soon.